Number 10. Not so friendly fire. What happens when you mix an Ottoman invasion, alcohol, and gunpowder? I'm not sure, but I imagine it's pretty bad. Just like the Battle of Karensbys, where embarrassingly enough, the Austrian army fired upon itself. Now, looking up military history will tell you that friendly fire incidents are more common than you might think. I'm looking at you, Vietnam War, but this incident is a little more unique as it may have started over a bottle of booze. A group of soldiers procured some alcohol and was enjoying the joys of liquid courage. After getting too boisterous, more Austrians wanted to join in. Not wanting to share their boozy finds and feelings, a fight broke out. The Austrian army was composed of multiple nations, so there were a few different languages being spoken. And by that, I mean a very confusing fight broke out. Eventually, someone fired a shot, someone shouted Turks, and a very embarrassing battle ensued. By the end, it's speculated that 10,000 Austrians were unalived during this boozy mistake. That's, hey. Hey, happens. Mistakes are made, happens. Number eight, abandoned by the world. 1930s Germany wasn't a great place to be if you were Jewish. Matter of fact, anywhere near Germany was a bad time for Jewish people. Some people saw the writing on the wall and it was clear. Anyone lighting a menorah during the holiday season needed to leave Europe and set sail for more liberal waters. In 1939, a vessel called the St. Louis arrived in North American waters, searching for freedom and to escape persecution persecution that would likely lead to their deaths. This is an unfortunate black spot in western democracies. As for the weary travelers, finding someone who would take them in was proving difficult. They tried Cuba, but were refused all but a handful. Then the US, same thing happened. They even tried glorious Canada, where they too refused them. Canada, a country of freedom and acceptance for all, turned down people in their darkest hour. Sadly, the boat returned to Europe where they met the same fate as other Jews who were oppressed by the regime. Number 7. Civil Rights I know a lot of these are World War II related, but, but bear with me guys. It had a lot of uncomfortable moments. Some that should be talked about. Acknowledging and apologizing for mistakes of the past is a sure way to have a brighter future. During World War II, there was something called the Germany First policy, meaning a lot of effort was made to defeat Germany first, but Imperial Japan was just as much as a threat. Apparently so much so that President Roosevelt wanted to put Japanese Americans in something called relocation camps. Thousands of Japanese Americans and Japanese Canadians, cause oh yeah, we did it too, were taken from their homes and relocated to camps in order to prevent a second Pearl Harbor. You don't need an HR manager to tell you what an egregious act this is against civil rights. While they were not like the camps found in Europe, it's yet another dark splotch on two countries who boast about their freedoms and democracy. The camps were closed shortly after the war had ended. Number 5. Sticky Situation The molasses flood of 1919 sounds like a lot of sweet fun, but it was actually a horrific event, and not just for diabetics. It was uncomfortable for two reasons. Reason number one being that 21 people lost their lives at what must have been the most confusing thing ever to see. A rush of sticky molasses flooded the streets of Boston and caused a crazy amount of damage. Reason number two being, well, how this occurred in the first place. I'll give the folks at home a second to take a guess at how they think it happened. Ready? If you said workplace neglect, congratulations, you went bragging rights. Basically, it was foobar from the start. The large tank that held the sweet stuff wasn't built properly, wasn't properly inspected by professionals. No one really understood, I guess, that fermentation produces gas, which made an already unsafe tank more unsafe. And well, there you go, boom, an unholy sticky flood. Probably one of the biggest lessons in work safety history. And let's be honest, who wants to swim in molasses? You never get out of it. Number four, Broken Arrow. The Cold War wasn't exactly cold, as nuclear weapons had the potential to make it hot. Too hot. So here's something to make everyone lose a little more sleep at night, because I know everyone at home is stress free right now and gets a full eight hours of sleep. Tonight when you lay your wee head to rest on Count Sheep, I want you to think about Broken Arrow. No, not actually a broken arrow, but the broken arrow incident or incidents, which if you didn't know is the code phrase for a nuclear device gun MIA. For example, on July 28th, a US aircraft from Dover Air Force Base, Delaware was carrying three nuclear bombs over the Atlantic Ocean. The plane experienced a loss of power and the crew jettisoned two nuclear bombs into the ocean. 
and they have never been recovered. Wow, that's great. There were at least another dozen broken Arrow incidents from the 1950s until the end of the Cold War. Now, as bad as that sounds, I mean, it's pretty bad. These are our nukes we're talking about. At least America's lost bombs were recorded. Nobody really knows how many bombs the Soviet Union lost during the Cold War. Gee, now I feel real swell and safe. Number three, Ich bin ein Belena. This may be old news to those of our older audience, but news to younger. And honestly, it's crazy that it even happened in the first place. So World War II ends, right? And the Allies are all super good friends, right? Wrong! Berlin basically gets split into two, Capitalist West and Communist East. So the Cold War kicks off, a very strong disagreement on what political and economical structure is better. As it turns out, life was just better on the West. People in the East just didn't have access to certain things the West did. So people started bailing shit. I don't blame them. So much so that a wall was built dividing the two. This may not sound like much, but it was huge. The Berlin Wall divided families, business, and put on the full display of failure that communism was. As JFK said, democracy is not perfect, but we've never had to put a wall up to keep our people in. And honestly, the guy's right. That's just kind of crazy. Number two, can't beat them, join them. Japan was the new cool kid in school, and by that, I mean they were the most powerful force in Asia in the late 1930s. Japan rapidly adopted westernized ideas, structures, and the old habit of invading foreign nations, and wrecking absolute havoc when there. Specifically, Nanking in 1937. Some historians consider this to be the beginning of World War II, but it's debatable. What's not debatable is the uncomfortable way Imperial Japanese forces treated Chinese civilians. Japan was expanding during the early 20th century, and China was next on the schedule. I'm going to recommend you Google this one at home, as there is so much naughty stuff about Nanking in 1937 that I'd get the censors a headache just thinking about it. There's a really infamous photograph that you probably haven't seen, and it's 100% not safe for work. The invasion of China and incidents like that of Nanking still have sour relations between the two nations today. Number one, the world is yours. Okay, so kind of a broad stroke here, but very fitting. I'm putting everything the British Empire did at the number one spot. I mean, come on, guys, it's the British Empire. Sure, it's no secret what they did, but there's so much to unpack here. It's a lot. Redcoats have been making things uncomfortable since the late 1600s. The American colonies and how they treated Indians, the occupation of actual India, and the opium wars in China, just to name a few. At its height, the British Empire had conquered. 25% of the Earth's land surface. And like I always say, when you get that big, you gotta break a few eggs along the way to make your omelet. Number 10, Yes Men. I talk about World War II a lot on this channel, but it's hard not to. It's the biggest, baddest war ever. So it would have been nice to avoid the whole thing, really. Wouldn't have been, it would have been great. And honestly, it, it could have been. But more interesting, I think, and pretty shameful, was how the world treated the rise of Mustache Man. Germany, after World War I, went from stinky zero to hunky hero in just a couple decades, thanks to the evil and terrible deeds of Mustache Man. When Mustache Man wanted more territory, the Allied nations practiced something called appeasement. Basically, okay, you can have Austria, but no Czechoslovakia, that's out of bounds, you can't have it. Then he would go and take it, and nothing was done about it. Mustache Man steamrolled his way through Europe, when really, he could have been stopped years prior. Shameful, really. Number nine, stirring the pot. I had to get these two out of the way. World War I, big shame on that one, Chief. Being one of the main causes of World War II is a great point, but for my money, it's how it even started in the first place. Europe was seeing rising tensions as every major power in the neighborhood was bulking up like Johnny Bravo on steroids. They were also looking at gaining more land, which is typical, but what wasn't was the blaming and name game that everyone seemed to uphold. After Franz Ferdinand was shot in Sarajevo, what could have been a conflict between Serbs and Austrians exploded into the worst global conflict at the time, until the sequel. Russia declared war on Austria, Germany declared war on them, then France with a rebuttal, and then the Ottomans were there too. It was just really a big mess. It's shameful how much human life was lost in such a short time, arguably over nothing. Number eight. Mad. For our older audience, they may remember a scarier time in life when the Soviet Union and the United States were at each other's throats. The Cold War. Not sure why it's called the Cold War, because uh, there was a lot of hot wars in that time period. And you know what's hotter than war, right? Nuclear Armageddon. Yes, this was a time of great panic and fear, as the threat of nuclear war was very real. I don't have enough time to bring up every incident, but things did escalate. Checkpoint Charlie, the Cuban Missile Crisis, some radar issues. You get the point. I went over to see the chief last night, and you know what? He said it wasn't it. 
Mutually Assured Destruction was the acronym made to comfort most people in the idea that if one nuclear weapon is detonated, then all of them will, in response, destroy one another. Which I think is very shameful. Nukes are just the worst. Let's put them away. Put them away. We don't need them, guys. Come on. Number seven. When in doubt, throw it out. In 2022, I don't have to tell you about climate change or the effects on the environment. If I do, then perhaps a few episodes of Bill Nye the Science Guy will help you along the way. It's a good show. But what's very shameful is how we treated this big blue and green spinning ball we all live on. And oh yes, I said ball. Earth is not round. Sorry not, sorry flat earthers. Since the industrial revolution, it's been nothing but high pollution and dumping garbage in the ocean. Which, hey, I get it. Out of sight, out of mind. I do the same thing when ice falls from the dispenser from the fridge. What do you expect me to do? Pick it up, mom? Pfft. How about sweep it underneath the fridge with the already dirty pair of socks, mom? Nice try though. But seriously, the way we treated our own planet is shameful. It's our home, how we came to be. And we just haven't been treating Mother Earth that well, really. Plus, I've seen Wally. I don't want to end up like that. So you make sure you recycle, eat your vegetables, maybe only take the self driving car out twice a week. I don't know. Number six, YouTube's favorite S word. Come on, you know I had to talk about this. This is just very shameful. Well, most people think of America during the S trade days. It is not an American invention. It has been happening for thousands of years and sadly still continues today in certain corners of the world. I like people. I like most people. And for one, I could never bring myself to ever treat another person this way. It is a very shameful part of human history in general. And hopefully one day there will be a world where that has been eradicated completely. I'd like to talk more on this subject, but it's a topic that deserves a real conversation. Not from a mildly funny Chris Farley like comedian on the internet. Sorry. Number five. Look ma, I've got three arms. Nukes are bad, radiation is bad. I for one wouldn't want a third arm. As much as I love General Grievous, but we've been over that. But once again for our older audience and or people who were around in the 1980s, they might remember something of a real disaster with nuclear results. No, not a bomb or a missile, but a nuclear reactor malfunction. The Chernobyl disaster was a malfunction in Chernobyl reactor number four that caused a meltdown, kind of like me when I'm reading right now. Explosions in the reactor leaked very lethal amounts of radiation. The handling of the situation was shameful to say the least as poor design and negligence is to blame. The nearby city of Pripyat had to evacuate. 50,000 people used to live here and now it's a ghost town. That was for all my Call of Duty fans in the audience but yes, that is what they're talking about in the game. To this day the city is abandoned and people will not be able to return for many many years to come. This accident did claim the lives of many people and the health effects of the radiation are still being monitored today. Number 4 Sleeping Giant December 7th 1941 was a beautiful day just like any other at Pearl Harbor Naval Base in Honolulu. When out of the skies came barreling down Japanese aircraft looking to cripple the American Navy so Japan could continue conquering the Pacific without anyone getting in their way. As dishonorable as the sneak attack was, it did make sense, in theory. Crippling the American Navy would be a great idea and buy you a lot of time. They destroyed battleships and 2,000 Americans lost their lives in the shameful surprise attack. It is too bad, however, that the objective was not fully completed because America was going to get its revenge. And honestly, they kind of deserved a little revenge after that, let's be honest. American aircraft carriers were not present at Pearl Harbor, and while the damage was bad with the attack, it inspired everyone across the country. And with America's industrial strength, whatever was destroyed, the Pacific Fleet was back up and running shortly after that. Way faster than the Japanese thought it was gonna happen. Number three. I'll never let go, Jack. I'll never let go. The Titanic. Everyone knows the Titanic, and everyone remembers the steamy scene from the movie in the back of what looks like the first car ever made. Nice. But what's shameful about Titanic is the hubris of its claim to fame. An unsinkable ship that well, was thought to be unsinkable. Well, now it's at a very deep point in the Atlantic Ocean, so that plan didn't exactly work out, did it? There were some safety measures put in place, but who needs them when your ship will never founder? There's many theories on how and why the Titanic sank, from the lack of lifeboats, the captain, and even its construction and design. But definitely, it was a hard sell on the unsinkable. You'd be surprised how vulnerable you are when you assume that you're invulnerable. Very true. Number two. Lethal production. The American Civil War was the crucible that shaped America. A few years of brutal fighting, brother versus brother, had left its mark on the country. President Abraham Lincoln had survived the war and the chaos of the politics that forced a nation into civil war. Emancipation Proclamation set a severely brutalized people free from their bonds. So after all this hair pulling stress, Lincoln found himself in Ford's theater for some entertainment. What Lincoln actually got was a bullet in the head. 
by John Wilkes Booth, failed actor and shameful killer. Say what you will about Lincoln's top hat and beard, Lincoln held the country together the best he could. I don't know if anyone today had the leadership to match his. Jamie wasn't around longer. Who knows what else he could have accomplished? Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Rhode Island Vampire. In the late 1800s, tuberculosis was spreading rapidly in Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Vermont. This obviously would have been pretty terrifying for the residents of these places, but things quickly took a very dark turn. Since many of the people who were passing away from this illness appeared very obviously ill with sunken, drained faces, for some reason, the logical response was that people believed they had been the prey of vampires. There was a family in Exeter, Rhode Island that had multiple people pass away from the illness, so then people believed that someone in the family must be feeding the vampire. They even went as far as to exhume the bodies of some of the deceased family members to make sure that they weren't undead. One of the exhumed bodies had passed away more recently, so her body was in a better condition, which people, of course, took as a sign of her being a vampire. This led them to burn her heart and liver and then mix the ashes with water. This is most definitely a crime today and pretty scary, but to make things even worse, they gave this concoction to other people in the town who had fallen ill as some kind of a cure. Imagine having to drink that and then still having tuberculosis after. Definitely not a good trade off. In our number nine spot today, we have the history of dentures. Personally, I don't have a ton of experience with dentures, but they seem to be a pretty straightforward thing these days, aside from the cost of dental, of course, but things weren't always the way that they are today. Instead of dentures being made of fake teeth before, they used to be made with real human teeth, which is absolutely disgusting. After the Battle of Waterloo, scavengers went and took the teeth off of corpses, which is quite a job, and then they sold these teeth to dentists. The dentists would boil the teeth, chop the roots off, and then attach these teeth to ivory base plates and then sell them to customers. Aside from this being an extremely morally questionable practice in its entirety, it's also just very creepy. In our number 8 spot today, we have the smallpox spread. I'm sure at some point or another, most of us learned about smallpox and the epidemic, which is something that we luckily don't really have to worry about much anymore. But one thing a lot of people explained that they didn't know was how badly it devastated indigenous peoples. Europeans who came over to America brought with them a multitude of diseases that they would have had some immunity to considering it was likely their bodies had encountered it before. But this was not the case for those already living on the land that is now referred to as North America. Indigenous Americans not only had no immunity towards this disease, but also the traditional ways of treating illness may have only exacerbated the symptoms. Because, of course, how could you possibly know how to treat something that you've literally never seen before and with no help from the people who do actually know how? It has been estimated that the spread of disease caused the population of indigenous Indigenous Americans to decline by 70%. There is a theory that the spread of disease may have been one of the only things that led to the colonization of North America. In our number seven spot today, we have the Tulsa riot. This event occurred on May 31st and June 1st of 1921, and it has actually been called the single worst incident of racial violence in American history. This happened in the Greenwood district of Tulsa, Oklahoma, and basically just mobs of white racist people went out and attacked black residents and businesses. What started this was when a 19 year old black man named Dick Rowland was accused of harming a white girl and he was subsequently arrested and there were rumors that he was going to be lynched. This of course drew a bunch of racist white people out of their homes to participate, but then a group of around 75 black men showed up to make sure that he didn't get lynched. One thing led to another and a firefight broke out that led to 10 of the white people and two of the black people being killed. After this, all hell broke loose. In 2020, the the last living survivor of the massacre, R&B and jazz saxophonist Hal Singer, a total legend, passed away at the age of 100. In the same year, this massacre finally became a part of the Oklahoma State curriculum, and it's about time, only a century too late. In our number six spot today, we have Heraclitus of Ephesus. Heraclitus was an ancient Greek philosopher who helped push the notion that the universe is in constant change, as well as the unity of opposites where the universe is a system of balance exchanges. This is all fine and well, but where things get a little troublesome is in his own personal life. You see, the thing is, is that he was a misanthrope, and his dislike for humankind led
led him to having long stretches where he was quite isolated. He would wander through the wilderness alone, surviving on plants and other things that he could scavenge. In the end, he came down with a pretty terrible and painful illness called dropsy, which is an accumulation of fluid underneath the skin. Doctors were unfortunately unable to help him, so he took matters into his own hands. He decided to cover himself in cow dung under the belief that as it dried, it would draw the moisture out from under his skin. This could have been a genius idea, albeit super gross, but things took a very, very dark turn. Covered in the dung, he laid out in the sun to dry, but the dung created a body cast and left him unable to move. This inability to move also left him unable to shoo off the pack of wild dogs that ended up surrounding him. So unfortunately, he was eaten alive. I guess I can understand why this one may have been left out of history class. In our number four spot today, we have the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. New York City's Triangle Shirtwaist factory fire in 1911 was an unbelievably terrible incident that led to changes being made for factory workers in America. The Triangle Shirtwaist factory was located on the 8th, 9th, and 10th floors of a building in Greenwich Village, and it of course was where shirtwaists were made, which we would now call a woman's blouse. I call this place a factory, but it was definitely more like a sweatshop, and the employees were mostly comprised of young women. So, like I mentioned before, in 1911, there was unfortunately a fire that broke out on the eighth floor, and because of the very cramped and unsafe working conditions, the fire ended up claiming the lives of 146 people that day. After more details came out about the incident and how the terrible working conditions were mostly to blame for the amount of lives that were lost, protests broke out all around the city. People began demanding better for the women who had to work in these kinds of places. Like Just as an example, the doors to the stairwells and exits were locked so that employees couldn't take unauthorized breaks. How unbelievable is that? And the worst part is that the owners of the company, who were largely responsible for what happened that day, basically just got off scot-free. If you want to know more about this fateful day, the amazing podcast My Favorite Murder by Georgia Hardstark and Karen Kilgariff has an episode that does a wonderful job covering it. In our number three spot today, we have Bikini Island. Bikini Island is located within the Marshall Islands, and it was once the home to around 170 islanders. In 1940, the US president at the time, Harry Truman, ordered that the military test their nuclear weapons in the case of a future where they would be deemed necessary since World War II had just ended and people were of course feeling concerned about what the future would hold. Since Bikini was located in a place where ships and planes don't normally travel very close to, unfortunately it was the spot chosen for this testing site. The residents of the island were asked to vacate, quote, for the good of mankind and to end all world wars, to which they of course obliged under the impression that they would one day be able to move back. After this, the testing began, and in 1954, the US military detonated Castle Bravo, which is one of the most powerful weapons at 15 megatons. There were 22 other weapons that were detonated on this island as well, so it's safe to say this place got a ton of nuclear activity, which left it with extremely high levels of radiation. This left residents unable to return for much longer than anticipated, with the first returning in the 70s. But of course, shortly after, these poor people moved back, they realized that the island still had totally unsafe levels of radiation, making it still unfit to live on, which has left it still uninhabited. In our number two spot today, we have strange medicine. It's not necessarily uncommon for us to hear about strange things that people in the past used to do, but sometimes those strange things are also disgusting. It was extremely common in the past for people to use human remains as a form of medicine. These gruesome treatments would consist of things such as blood, ground up human skulls, Skull, and even human fat. Tomb Raiders would even steal remains in order for them to be sold to the wealthy, which is incredibly dark, and apparently mummy remains were the ideal remains for these sorts of things, which then led to a shortage of mummies. Never thought I'd be in a position where I'd be talking about a shortage of mummies, but truly anything can happen over here on Bumblebee. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have a sticky situation. Okay, so this one is less of an event, more of just a historical invention that absolutely 
absolutely should not have existed, and that is the sticky bomb. After the British hurriedly evacuated France in 1940, they were facing the threat of German invasion and had come up with some weapons that could be used against tanks. Thus, the sticky grenade or sticky bomb was born. It was formally called the anti tank hand grenade number 74, and basically, the design was that there was a metal outer shell that covered a bomb coated in adhesive. The idea was to have the user pull a pin to remove the metal casing, where they could then run up to a tank, use the sticky adhesive to stick it to the tank, activate the five second fuse, and get the heck out of there. Or they could just throw it and hope it's stuck. Well, there's a few problems with this design. The first one that I'm sure all of us can understand is that uh, the adhesive didn't want to stick to anything dusty or wet or muddy, which are all things that happen to be common on tanks. You know what they did like to stick to though? Human skin. Unfortunately, this invention could prove much more detrimental to the person who was attempting to use it. Despite these very obvious and dangerous flaws, it was still used by a few different armed forces, but I don't think anyone has used it in recent history, which is truthfully probably for the best. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the rich remains. When we think of the story of the Titanic, we of course think of the sinking of the ship, we talk about how the survivors were saved, and then of course we think of the catastrophic loss of life. Many people don't really stop to ask, what happened with all of those who passed in the tragedy, however? More than 1,500 passed away in the sinking of the Titanic, and only 337 bodies were pulled out of the water. A scholar named Jess Beer has recently examined what was done with those bodies, and through this research, they have come to realize that whether or not these people got identified and what happened to their remains in the end all depended on their class and economic standing in life. About one third of the recovered bodies ended up being returned to see because the rescuers didn't think that they would get any sort of life insurance payout from the families of those who had passed and who were of a lower economic standing. For any bodies to be preserved for land burial, the remains had to be easily identifiable and they needed to have a quote economic value even after death with a high social or economic worth. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Titanic radio. This is a piece of the ship that has not yet been recovered, but it's the focus of much debate on whether or not it should be retrieved from the wreckage. Known in 1912 as the Marconi wireless telegraph machine, the radio on the Titanic sent distress calls to nearby ships that ended up saving the lives of 700 people in lifeboats. Despite how many people died in the Titanic tragedy, there were debates about whether or not to retrieve the artifact because of the fact that there might still be huge human remains located in the same area as the radio is. Lawyers have argued against the recovery of the radio because the dive plan did not include the prospect of there being human remains located down there. It also was argued because in order to retrieve it, they would need to cut into the ship's radio compartment, which was strongly opposed by preservation advocates. As of right now, it appears as though the dive to retrieve the radio will still occur, but in the end, the pandemic delayed things quite a bit, so at this point, it isn't clear exactly when. This radio Radio would be a very valuable artifact, but it would also hold a really eerie tale of exactly when and how the radio was used during the final moments of the Titanic. In our number 8 spot today, we have the heads up. I'm not sure why, but for actual years, I thought that on the day of the Titanic sinking, the iceberg they hit just kind of came out of nowhere and surprised them. So imagine my surprise when I found out that that wasn't true, even in the slightest. Turns out the entire thing absolutely could have been avoided. The crew had received six warnings about the iceberg before the collision. While the first few warnings were received by the captain, not all of them were, and it's not totally clear why. Although the crew knew about the icy conditions of the water, they didn't slow down much, which some have called a reckless decision, but apparently this actually was standard practice at the time, so I suppose you can't really blame them. The final warning, however, was received from a ship that had halted for the night due to an ice field a few miles away. Way, and when the message was being relayed to the captain, he cut it off and said to shut up as he was working Cape Race. In our number 7 spot today, we have a love letter. Richard Geddes was a cabin attendant on the Titanic who wrote a love letter to his wife while aboard, but unfortunately she would never go on to receive it. The letter was written on the original Titanic stationery, and it even had its original white star line envelope when it was found. While this story in itself is of course extremely sad, and again one of those reminders of the human side of those who were in this incident, this letter also contained something else besides utterings and confessions of 
of Love. It also featured a description that Richard wrote for his wife of a near collision that the Titanic had with the SS city of New York, obviously prior to this terrible iceberg incident. There were people who had witnessed this near collision and believed that it was a bad omen for the Titanic. In our number 6 spot today we have the emergency systems. The time from the point where the ship actually hit the iceberg until the first lifeboats were launched was an entire hour. That is way too long when it is an emergency of this magnitude, which obviously leaves us wondering why. Well, as it turns out, a lot of people thought that the alarm bells were actually just a drill and they stayed inside where it was warm. This is already terrible, but what's even worse is that for the people who didn't think it was a drill, they had absolutely no idea where to go or what to do in the case of an emergency. They had never done any lifeboat drills, so everyone was just panicking with nowhere to go. Due to this lifeboat delay, there wasn't enough time to launch all of the remaining lifeboats successfully. There were even two boats that never got launched at all. That is obviously terrible because there are so many people who potentially could have been saved had this delay never happened. I also just can't imagine how frightening it would have been to be in the middle of that emergency with absolutely no direction at all. In our number 5 spot today we have the portholes. Since the Titanic sunk, people have been trying to figure out exactly how this unsinkable ship sank and how it sank so quickly. A recent study may have found a previously undiscussed scenario that likely contributed to the speed of the sinking ship greatly. On that fateful day, of course, the Titanic had grinded to a halt and at that point the passengers had no idea why. Like I just mentioned. This led to many of them opening the portholes in the ship to get a look out in case they could see anything that would be stopping them from continuing on their journey. Many of those people who opened the portholes didn't close them after, and with every open porthole that went underwater, it is estimated that it doubled the size of the damage to the ship. It is possible that these open windows may have caused the ship to sink at double the rate it would have had those windows have been closed. Of course, this is not to blame the passengers, however, as this tragedy is certainly not their fault. In our number 4 spot today we have the telegraph. Okay, so you know how people often explain that perhaps many more people would have been saved or could have been saved from the Titanic wreck if the nearby SS California had their telegraph operator awake when the distress call was sent? For the man who went to sleep, that's a heavy burden to bear for the rest of your life, but a recent study suggests that even if he was awake, there likely wouldn't have been anything that he could have done. Firstly, there wasn't any rule stating that this guy needed to be awake for 24 hours to man the telegraph machine. So right there, he is off the hook. This is not his fault. This study however suggests that even if he was awake and the ship received the distress call, the ice around the Titanic was so thick that they likely wouldn't have been able to get through to save the passengers either way. Turns out this disaster really just had the perfect recipe for tragedy. In our number 3 spot today we have True Love. Two of the first class passengers who were on the ship were the elderly couple Isidore and Ida Stratus. When the ship started to sink and lifeboats were being boarded, attendants were ushering Ida into one of the lifeboats, but of course without her husband since women and children were being rescued first. Ida however refused to leave her husband and Isidore refused to be rescued before other men. Instead they both chose to stay on the ship and they went down together. Ida said, I will not be separated from my husband. As we have lived, so we will die together. Survivors who witnessed their love last saw the pair standing on the deck with their arms around each other. This love story is incredibly tragic, but also just a testament to how much they loved each other. I am very glad that in those frightening moments, they at least had each other there with them. In our number 2 spot today, we have the lifeboats. Before the Titanic set sail during their preparation for the journey, at some point, people made a decision to reduce the number of lifeboats that were on board. They did this because they didn't want to clutter the deck, which is really trivial when we are talking about the safety of 2,208 passengers that were on board the ship that day. The number of lifeboats ended up being reduced to just 20, with an additional 4 that were collapsible. This meant that should they have had time to launch every single one, this would still only be enough for half of the passengers on board. That's a terrible ratio. And as we now know, during the sinking of the ship, 
Not even all of the lifeboats were able to be launched as everything just happened too quickly. There are quite a few lessons that can be and definitely were learned from the sinking of the Titanic because the more we learn, the more we realize that the safety precautions taken for the ship simply just were not up to par. In our number one spot today, we have the brittle fracture. This is another one of those theories behind how the Titanic found itself at the bottom of the North Atlantic. There was an expedition down to the wreckage of the Titanic and it revealed something very interesting about the hull of the ship. There were these large pieces of steel that were recovered, each with about three rivet holes 1.25 inches in diameter. These pieces revealed that the hull's iron rivets failed to brittle fracture, which is a sudden and rapid snapping. This means that there was a failure in the structural materials and this usually happens as a result of low temperature, high impact loading, and high sulfur content, all three of which were present on the night of the tragedy. The water temperature was below freezing, the Titanic was traveling at a high speed on impact with the iceberg, and the hull steel contained high levels of sulfur. These chunks of metal gave researchers one of the main answers as to why the Titanic sunk that night. Number 10, Flat Earth. All right, folks, let's just get it out of the way here. There's no such thing as a flat earth. Say it with me. There is no such thing as a flat earth. Never has, never will. Those that wish to ignore factual proven evidence of such, well, I salute you. That's the same kind of stubbornness that keeps old marriages still alive. No, my keys are not on the key hook. They're where I left them, in the dish by the kitchen. That's where they always go. They're probably on the key hook. All stale marriage jokes aside, the Flat Earth community has been busy. Say what you will about them, but they are not lazy. Years of experiments, research, and conventions with awkward handshakes have concluded one result. Earth is not round. I'd like to come out here today and tell you folks all about the models and theories presented to you by the Flat Earth community, but all you need to know is that Earth's flat, the government is watching you, and I wear women's underwear. Two of those things are true, and one is a fib. See if you can figure it out. Number 9, The Battle of Tonkin. In the 1960s, there was a little old country in the little old east causing a whole heap of trouble. Vietnam was about to turn red, and not the kind of red you feel when your crush asks you to homecoming. <laughs> But the kind of red that makes luxuries hard to come by and lineups for bread and ration, comrade. <laughs> The United States, not wanting any more communist countries on the map, decided action was needed and parked a whole bunch of spooky, scary Navy ships in the Tonkin Bay. That's close to Vietnam. That's when they were fired upon. So like a good game of Hasbro's battleship, they fired back. And shortly after that, the war in Vietnam had started. Ooh, okay, spicy. Trouble is, the Tonkin Bay incident was very fishy from the start, as a lot of the reports just didn't line up. For a while, it seemed staged, and years later, it kind of was, as the situation wasn't as black and white as originally presented. It was more of a gray thing, and they might have used it as an escape goat to go and do what they did. Uh-oh. Number eight, small fry Japan versus Russia. The turn of the century was an interesting time to say the least. Spent enough time on it in history class, always did my history homework, but nations were becoming free, factories and black smoke from industry filled the skies, and the idea of having roads filled with cars instead of horses was becoming more of a reality instead of a dream each day. However, some were still behind the times and some were still flexing imperial muscles. Take Russia and Japan in 1905 for instance. Japan, a brand new industrialized modern country was expanding westward. Russia, an old imperial power that had not modernized, was expanding eastward. They met not too far from Korea. Now, tensions were high, but it wasn't until a Japanese train carrying supplies was destroyed that the war broke out. The thing is, the train maybe sort of kind of could have been a scapegoat by the Japanese to start a war. I'm not sure it could have been, I don't know. Number seven, World War II. Imagine you were a farmer in France after losing your livelihood in the battles of World War I. Your fields were destroyed, the barns gone, the land is tainted by the horrors and disease of the war. Then after 20 years of long and hard work bringing your farm back to life, it all gets destroyed again in a second global war. That would be 10 times as destructive as the first. Oof. Sounds like someone's out to get you. Well, all jokes aside and actual battles aside, World War II is full of fishy events that are very sus and make you squint when hearing about certain information. Like for example, leading German scientists mysteriously disappearing and America very quickly developing a rocket program thereafter. 
Mm. Or like top German scientists taking vacation photos on a beautiful beach in Sao Paulo. Some things just don't add up. Hmm, strange. Number six, Roy Sullivan. The Human Lightning Rod. Heck of a nickname. Wish that was my nickname in high school, but well earned. Roy Sullivan was a park ranger in Virginia and spent his time in the same river John Denver likes to sing about. What makes Roy different from every other park ranger who spends too much time alone? Lightning. Between the years of 1942 and 1977, Roy was struck by lightning seven times and survived all of them. It got to the point where people wanted to avoid him in fear that they too would be crisped up like someone who's too good at Mario Kart from a lightning bolt. He's recognized by Guinness World Records as being struck by lightning seven times and surviving seven times. Pretty impressive. I don't have any Guinness records. I wish I did. Number five, Kennedy. The assassination of JFK was an instant conspiracy theorist dream come true. And a national tragedy. Yeah, it was. From Lee Harvey Oswald, the Blam Blam, the trajectory, and Jack Ruby, it's just a really strange story. And everyone was blamed from the grassy knoll to Soviet sleeper agents. Or it could have just been a nut job. No one's really 200% sure. What am I getting at with this? Well, it's all fishy. And for some, it felt staged from the start, especially if you understand the connection between the Kennedy family and the Cosa Nostra. The Irishman movie actually explains a lot of this. I would highly recommend that movie. But it could be related back to the associates of a Russell Buffalino, a known organized crime king and racketeering magnate. Regardless, it'll always feel weird and staged. Just strange. Number four, Sputnik. The space race, what a time to be alive. It truly must have been something to see. For those that don't know, the space race refers to a time during the Cold War when America and the Soviet Union were dumping millions of dollars and hours to see who could dominate space. America being presented as the country with a technological advantage, and honestly, it wasn't propaganda at that time, they, they truly did have the advantage, were visibly shocked when the USSR had launched the first satellite into space. Before this, there were a few things here and there, the first rocket, the first dog, the first man. While the first cosmonaut was concerning for Americans, it was the launching of Sputnik 1 that was the scariest, as it seemed the Soviet Union may actually have the upper hand. It kicked the space race into overdrive. But surely nations wouldn't. They wouldn't compete on such a science fair level, right? <laughs> no way. Seems kind of sus. <laughs> no. Number three, Elvis Presley. Look, this makes a lot of sense when you think about it. Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll and the gyrating hips. Oh, baby. He came to fame in the early to mid 1950s and broke records instantly. In a sense, he was the first celebrity that we idolize, or at least the way we idolize celebrities today. Elvis couldn't really do anything without the paparazzi following him or fans screaming and shouting his name the second the man made an appearance. Years of rocking, partying, and fried peanut butter, banana bacon sandwiches caught up with the king. As he looked closer to me in leather suits than Adam would. It was kind of a weird look. He passed away on August 16th, 1977, and well, it does seem kind of strange that the king would leave the building like that. There's even some reports of him showing up later in life in disguises. So perhaps maybe he didn't, or did live or die. We'll, we'll never know. Number two, the Roswell incident. Roswell, New Mexico, 1947. A mysterious UFO makes a crash landing in the New Mexican desert. Military and government officials are quick to clean up the mess and haul the wreckage to Area 51, or so the story goes. It wasn't long before folks started claiming it was little green men from outer space, and given the scientific and militaristic weird testing that actually happened in the deserts back then, well, it kind of adds up. However, the US government has since declassified the event as a weather balloon crashing. People like to think it's still aliens, but what if it was staged? Hear me out here. Meaning, what if they crashed a weather balloon to make you think it was an alien, and something like that actually happened elsewhere? A classic illusion, or distraction, if you will. And number one, any alien abduction. They all feel staged to me. Every once in a while, you scroll through some TV stations, assuming this is a few years ago and you still have cable, and you'd see a guy with a weird haircut talking about ancient aliens building pyramids. History Channel can be weird sometimes. You may also come across real life encounters of folks who swear they've encountered aliens and were abducted. To me, it sounds like a lot of people want their 15 minutes of fame and perhaps inflated stories for the sake of good television. To me, it's strange a bunch of rural Americans getting abducted and perhaps receiving probes where the sun don't shine. There's a lot of that going on. It's a little weird. I was abducted by aliens. They took me out of my pickup truck. It was strange. There were lights everywhere. And someone touched my buttocks. 
Number 10. The Gordon Riots and the Letters of Ignatius Sancho. Named after the lord and possessor of the driest name known to history, George Gordon, these riots were sparked in response to new Catholic laws enacted to allow practitioners to participate in the British military. Despite the anti-Catholic rules not having been enforced for around a century. Despite this, the fears of treasonous plots and general strain of the Revolutionary War led to an explosion of violence that ended up requiring military intervention, and destroyed the reputation of leader John Wilkes. The most interesting records of these riots come from the letters of the late Ignatius Sancho, an African man who was known to frequently engage in social commentary. Published posthumously, these letters are a fascinating account detailing the Gordon riots firsthand. Number 9. The Signing of the Bill of Rights in 1689 This document is easily one of the most important in British history. Penned after the disastrous rule of King James II and the closing of the English Civil War, this document was written with the hopes of ensuring the inalienable rights to the average British citizen. In particular, the Bill of Rights outlined the mistakes of King James II in a way that would outline the expectation of what a king could and could not do. What needs to be understood here is that prior to this, the king was generally viewed as a representative of God. To write something into a law that limited their power was a bold statement, and the document has served as the basis for a number of constitutions alongside the current British one. Number 8. The Separation of Church and State While not exactly a specific moment, this concept was a sort of continuation of what the Bill of Rights started. Primarily pushed by Thomas Jefferson and John Locke, the idea of keeping the law of governance and God apart was not one accepted easily. As a result, John John Locke is generally seen as the father of liberalism with his movement. His modification of Hobbes' theory of absolutism, one that allowed the idea to come to fruition within the hearts and minds of numerous people. In particular, Locke was adamant that the state ought to avoid attempting to fold other religions into Christianity, believing that a singular religion would be more chaotic than a diverse one. Number 7. Copernicus Celestial Spheres An extremely important work by Nicholas Copernicus, this series of books was was instrumental in laying down the law of what was believed to be the order and movement of the planets. While certainly not the first to discover this, as more and more evidence has proven, the outline found within these six books put it to the test of social reception. The results were poor, and resulted in a number of conflicts with the church, as the text frequently contradicted their understanding of the world under God. As a result, copies were redacted and edited to weaken their legitimacy which led to the modern retitling of the book in a darkly humorous tone as the book nobody read. Nowadays, Copernican law is the baseline for space exploration and travel, so I think Nick can finally rest easy. Number 6. The Blazing World Margaret Cavendish, like far too many women of the time, was bored. As a result, she penned a work of prose fiction which went on to become one of the first works of science fiction. Taking place within a utopian kingdom, the work is a landmark for feminist readings into the social concepts of gender and sexuality. Cavendish, in an afterword, detailed her motivation for writing the book, and also slyly compared its writing to the accomplishments of Julius Caesar and Alexander the Great. The themes of the book generally aim towards the goal of breaking down social divisions in the name of progress. Number 5. A Vindication of the Rights of Women One of the earliest direct publications of feminist literature, Mary Wollstonecraft's writing differed from, from Cavendish's attempts to use fiction to promote ideas by taking the direct route. It was, and still is, a heavily controversial text, arguing against just about everything in an extremely scatterplot yet distinctly planned method. I can't pretend to agree with everything she wrote about gender and sexuality, but it would be hard to deny that her work was a landmark for the beginning of the movement to increase women's roles in Western society. Number 4. Newton's Principa Mathematica I'm not a mathematician, but even I can figure out that this was pretty important. Setting the foundations for modern physics, this is easily Isaac Newton's greatest achievement, not simply due to its creation, but its publication. Suddenly, the understanding of the invisible wasn't just something given to those who could afford an education, it was available for any 
anyone to consume at their leisure so long as they could read. Several editions would be published, the first becoming extremely rare to find within time. This text is credited with the beginning of the scientific revolution, and one copy of it was even carried to space in 2015. Number 3. The French Revolution After years of economic downturn, overpopulation, and frankly bizarre rulings on the methods of taxation, the people of France were fed up with living under the rule of kings who sent them to die in wars and gave them nothing in return. While a system had been in place to attempt to appease the people, it was clear that their representation was something of a joke amongst the nobility. A number of events could be described as the straw that broke the camel's back, but it was clear that the way things were going, no one was walking away free and clear, especially when Louis XVI and his entourage were executed, the first of thousands. Rising with the proclamation of liberté, égalité, and fraternité, the people-led revolution was a bloody conflict like none other, and a perfect demonstration of what can happen when authoritarian power is taken too far. Number 2. Hobbes' Leviathan One of the most important texts in existence today, Leviathan was penned by Thomas Hobbes during the English Civil War. Exploring the place of man, government, and religion within modern society, Hobbes drew up ideas for what eventually would become the social contract theory. This theory imagined that in order to participate within a society, the individual must consent to the surrender of their freedoms that are given by the nature of their very existence, in exchange for the protection of the rest of that society. Taking this idea and applying it to just about any interaction is just fascinating, and the ways in which it's influenced modern law are too numerous to count. Suffice it to say that there will never be another work quite so important. Number 1. The Rights of Man I lied! Yeah, Leviathan is super important, but Thomas Paine's defense of the French Revolution is my absolute favorite piece of literature from the Enlightenment period. I've pretty safely established myself as someone who's a pretty big fan of just outright revolt, and the claim that Paine makes is right up my alley. See, when Edmund Burke wrote an attack on the French Revolution, Paine countered that revolution ought to be permissible in the face of a government that does not safeguard its people's rights. This text was key in effecting changes to the newly formed United States government as well as the British rule, which were no doubt sweating at the prospect of their own age of terror. In particular, the rights of man is scathing towards the idea that the skill to govern a people can be inherited at all, a notion which was directly chomping at the skirts of certain other monarchs at the time. It's really sick, and might be a little bit more relevant than you'd think. Number 10. It's just a cold sore. The Victorian era is cool. The art, the fashion, and technology of the time, I think, are always fun to take a look at, especially since steampunk has its roots in the Victorian era, and who doesn't like steampunk? Come on, there's just a lot of cool steampunk stuff. And honestly, we haven't seen a lot of that in a long time. We need, we need more. We need more. Something not so cool from that era, however, was what you could catch from another person should you decide to take up a bed with another person. Syphilis, yep, one heck of a disease. Funny enough, it was so common that it was making intimacy itself an unusual practice. People were scared, and honestly, maybe rightfully so. There's no cure, and if it progresses to its later stages back then, well, you'd go crazy. And then you'd end up being that guy that's always screaming in the streets. Every city has one. You know what I'm talking about. Number eight, the products of our sins. Having fun when the lights can be turned off is great. Who doesn't enjoy a little toe curling? Yeah? Except sometimes there's this crazy thing that can happen where after nine months, another human spawns in. Insane, right? I know. Well, back in the Victorian era, this phenomenon was happening, but only for married couples. As you have to be married, of course, or else a child would be born out of wedlock, which to people at the time was just the worst. Oh, I never. These stigmas were not favorable for women, as some preferred to avoid that kind of press by abandoning or straight up just unaliving their children. Horrible, just, just horrible times. Just another one of those good old wholesome times in history where we were treating women with the utmost respect and decency. Very nice. We were actually not very nice. 
Number 7. Diet Bedroom misconduct was becoming a huge issue. Refer to number 9 and 10. While women did get most of the blame because, well, you know, history, men did get some of the blame. The issue of intimacy for men could be described as barbaric primal sense. So how do we curb this? How do we stop men from acting on these caveman urges, ooga booga? Well, simple really. Men just have to stop eating certain foods, as it was thought at the time that food had a link to the misconduct, or rather, the overabundance of bedroom related issues, including mustard, pepper, rich gravy, beer, wine, cider, and tobacco. And if you weren't paying attention, that's basically the diet of every man in Victorian times. Not sure how a jar of finely prepped mustard would get you flustered, but okay, sure. The beer makes sense though, you know, have a few beers, and even the mop leaning over in the corner looks pretty lonely. And Boy, that mop has lovely hair. Number six, job market. Ladies of the evening, women of the night. Women who make beds go bump in the night. They were everywhere in Victorian London, a lot. It's partially related to some of the points I previously mentioned. Now, I'm not here to say it's necessarily a bad thing. Personally, I don't think it is. As they say, it's the oldest profession in the book, with an estimated 80,000 women working in the night by the late 1890s. You'd have to be crazy to miss that. I mean, they, they were literally everywhere. With numbers like that, there's something for everyone and in varying price ranges, as they can be found in brothels or townhomes set up by the wealthy men for their mistresses, pretty much anywhere trouble likes to spawn. Even some artists took advantage of this by living with the gorgeous girls of the evening, as going behind closed doors with one was debatable, but becoming friends? Now that's a social transgression. That, oh, becoming friend. Oh, how dare you befriend the people of the night? Number four, the first counterculture. The 1960s were a very important time for many different people. Black Americans were fighting for the rights, music went from holding hands to strawberry fields, if you know what I'm saying, and everything that your parents told you just, just kind of felt wrong. If you grew up then, you know what I mean. I know people like to make fun of hippies, but there were some good ideas there. Well, in 1890s England, they were sort of having the same thing happen. Obviously, not as strong as a push as it was in the 60s, but still. Basically, after all the oppression towards bedroom relations, people began to open up. Uh, not literally, just, just open up thinking-wise. That's really gross, don't repeat that. There's only one way we all got here. Unless you're a test tube baby, of course. In that case, thank you for watching CT133576-2. To some historians, this makes sense. When you push and push for things to happen or ban, eventually people will push back, especially if it's something like bedroom time. Everybody, everybody likes a little bit of bedroom time. Valentine's Day wasn't too long ago. Remember that? It was good. It was fun. It was good, good fun. Number three, Jack the Ripper. While the man's numbers don't compare to any of the other horrible people in history, he's unusual because of his brutality and the fact that he was never caught. Jack the Ripper was maybe the first modern serial on Liver. He haunted the streets of Victorian London and is responsible for claiming multiple women's lives, women of the evening to be exact, and they began to know the name Jack the Ripper. Now we'll probably just have to show you pictures of Victorian London or maybe some b-roll of a shadowy figure because there ain't no way we can show the crime scenes. There's probably a dozen different theories on who done it. Some say it was multiple men using his name as an alias, some say it was Prince Albert, there's even some who suggest that he was a she, and which explains why women were so easy to go off with Jack. That actually kind of makes sense to me at least, and why no one really would be looking for a woman back then. Kind of makes sense. Anyway, be careful out there ladies, just, just be careful. Number two, Queen Victoria. It seems old blighty herself may have been a tad more promiscuous than you'd think a royal to be. Well, not with other men, but her husband who in her diary claims to be the love of her life, which honestly is kind of sweet and, and romantic, that's nice. One thing that I find interesting, however, is that while lewd images were outlawed, the queen may have commissioned a painting of herself that was quite risque for the time. To gift to her husband, of course. Hypocrisy much? I say lewd, but it was probably just in her loose fitting clothes with maybe like an ankle showing or something. Still, unusual behavior for the queen. I'll remember that the next time, Bly, I'll remember that. Number one, Prince Albert. If you've ever stepped foot into a tattoo parlor, then you might know where I'm going with this. Prince Albert, the husband of Queen Victoria, had some controversy circulating his name. One, because he shares a name with another Prince Albert, who was speculated to be Jack the Ripper, but also because of a very unique piercing. Go ahead and take a guess where that piercing is. Yeah, I didn't think so. As a man, if your anatomy could be described by an internet comedian using moderately funny euphemisms, then the piercing would go through your German army helmet. That makes sense, right? The horror, the absolute horror. It's rumored that he had one of these piercings. 
Did he? Uh, I'm not sure. But if it means anything to you, Nicholas II had a tattoo, so it's not completely out of the realm of possibility. Number 10, no calling, no gifts. This is a time in history when men were told to be gentlemen and women told to be ladies. Naturally, that came with some weird social practices. For instance, women were discouraged from accepting gifts from men. Personally, I like to give my girlfriend flowers and chocolate. I'm a classic guy, what can I say? Can't go wrong with that. However, even if a handsome silver tongued devil such as myself were to give some flowers and the finest dark chocolate a 7 Eleven has to offer, and a most promising woman were to accept said gifts, she may not be able to call me back. Literally, because well, the phone isn't exactly a thing yet, and also because that's something else women were just discouraged from doing. <sighs> call on a man? <sighs> no way, Jose! Even if he is super nice and waiting for a genuine response. One etiquette guidebook from 1882 called any woman who calls on a man ill-bred and positively improper to do so. I like when people give me flowers and chocolate. Maybe call me sometimes, I'm a little lonely. Number nine, act like a lady. How dare ladies do anything unladylike? Ugh, said every man ever in the Victorian era. This is a time in history when ladies gotta be ladylike. That means makeup, corsets, and, and don't you dare do anything masculine. Oh, that's me angry. This is still a time when food isn't the greatest either, so imagine if you got an upset tummy at the dinner table. Happens to me a lot. You've got a handsome prince that your parents have arranged for you to marry. When you go to greet him, you do it with a simple gesture as kneeling to curtsy could turn your linens a certain shade of embarrassment that 1800 stain cleaning technology could never wash away. You'd poop yourself. Where's Billy Mays when you need him, right? How dare a woman do such things as go number two, or even worse, break wind? Oh, the nerve! That's just the way it went, folks. I don't make the rules. Number eight, charged with love. Naturally, this was the past, and not being open to homosexuality was just the way it was. Especially when tucking yourself into bed at night alone wasn't allowed either. Homosexuality just wasn't gonna happen. They, they just weren't gonna be approved of it. It's just how it goes. It sucks. However, it's almost as if there's been love on this earth since day one, and to stop that kind of love, it's just silly, man. Wherever I go, everyone is welcome on this channel or my Twitch. Chetty loves everyone because in reality, this is a time period where you could wind up in jail for that kind of love. And as Awesome Powers would say, that's just not very groovy, baby. Yeah. Strangely enough, homosexual relationships between women might have been completely overlooked as they were sometimes mistaken for women being friends. Yeah, I know. Some women even lived together. But given that they probably needed each other for financial support, people just kind of thought that's how it went and they ignored it. It's like they live together and you start putting the pieces together and it's like, you know, they, I don't know, something weird going on there. But love everybody, come on, be nice. Number seven, a good thing. If I'm talking about medieval times, there's a good chance I'm gonna bring up the super not cool, not fun, do not condone or support the behavior of marrying a woman at the age of 12. Yucky. In part one, I mentioned that there was a ton of corners and streets being worked by the only other job besides street cleaners at 3 a.m. by women. However, after venereal disease was becoming a serious issue, it was getting pretty bad. It was becoming clear that a lot of people who were getting sick were young women. Like, 11 to 16 age group. Oof. Which I shouldn't have to tell you is bad. That, that's pretty bad, dude. When I was 16, I was rocking Black Ops 2, hanging out with my buddies, and partying hard in the summer. I got a lot of good stories. Maybe I'll share them one day. Catching all that nasty stuff is no way to spend your youth. So thank God the government changed the age of consent to 16 years old, which I know is not a solution for everything that was going on, but it was a small step forward in the right direction. That's what we like. Good history moving forward. We like that. Chetty likes. Number six, the seam seamstress. Being that the Industrial Revolution had started and business was booming, People needed to travel for business, or more specifically, men needed to travel for business, which means they gotta be away from their wives, and that means they're away from the very thing we're talking about today. Bedroom stuff. How did men solve this issue? Well, there was no shortage of ladies roaming street corners to uh, aid in, in that matter. However, there's an option with a little less syphilis. There were AIDS or early blow up dolls called travel ladies. Strangely enough, it was stored in a gentleman's hat. What? 
<sighs> That's so wrong. Once it was ready to be used, it was inflated and reassembled. This is a quote from an ad from one of the products. It is inflated to the essential part of the woman wanted by a man. That just, that just doesn't sound very good. This is why we have boards of people to check stuff from products before it gets shipped out to the public. I feel like that just wouldn't fly very well today. Number five, big polluter. This just doesn't make any sense. It never did to me, and it still doesn't. But in case you didn't know, self-pleasure was a big no-no, commonly called self-pollution, which honestly is very funny to me. That's just hilarious. Don't self-pollute yourself, Chris. That's bad. Don't do that. That's naughty. It was a sin and thought to be a cause for many ailments. I'm sure you've heard the classic saying that for guys, if you decided to go bump in the night by yourself, there's a good chance you'd need a walking stick because it would make you go blind. Women were also targeted, however, as for any pearl polishing by women was thought to be hysteric and needed to be treated for such. Look, the truth is, any man who wants to wax his chair or woman tuning a one dial radio should be able to do so without judgment of society or medical remedies of snake oil doctors. Love yourself, love everybody else, and just, as long as the bedroom door's closed, you're good. Just, just don't do it in public, you're good. Number four, shake and bake. I'm something of a scientist myself, but that doesn't mean I know everything. And if you actually need to learn something about health and safety, take it from a professional, not a second rate John Candy. However, when coming across this fact, I just had to share it. Cause with my medical knowledge, this just doesn't sound right. All right, so kids, we know how they're made. I don't need to go into detail for that. However, there was this idea back in the Victorian days that if a woman danced shortly after doing what mommy and daddies do, then there was a chance that her pregnancy just wouldn't happen. Or perhaps more commonly after riding a horse. S same idea, uh, okay. Which is frankly, horse. I mean, come on, my mom always told me when she was baking that I had to be quiet and stop running around the house or the cake she was baking wouldn't rise. Well, they always did. I love chocolate cake. I mean, really, I do. I'm starting to wonder if there's a connection here. I was a rowdy kid. Number three, the Kensington system. Poor Queen Victoria. I know this is kind of a stretch, but it relates back to the whole mistreating women thing. But basically, it was something implemented in order to control the young royal, make her dependent on her mother, whom she was not allowed to be without. Basically, modern day strict parents. Now, all the kids watching right now, or all the kids who've grown up, how well did that parenting work? Let us know in the comments. I'm willing to bet it created a little bit of a divide between parent and child, am I right? That's exactly what happened with Queen Victoria. Shouldn't be surprised, really. Being a parent is tough. I get that. But squeeze too hard and the sand falls through the cracks of your hand. Victoria wasn't even allowed an hour to herself. And I don't care who you are, no matter how charismatic or bubbly, everybody needs some alone time. Number two, a healthy breakfast. Okay, not Victorian London, but this is just too funny not to mention, and it's around the same time period, very close. As the great minds of the time thought, self-pollution was a big no-no, and the reason for these urges was often related to food. Some thought eating meat would make you down bad. So a man named John Harvey Kellogg, you might have heard of him, aimed to cure the sickness of self-love. What if a man had a delicious, nutritious meal to eat, especially at the start of his day? Cornflakes by Kellogg's, the, the very same cereal that's probably sitting on top of your fridge, yeah, was partially originally designed to stop you from feeling those carnal urges. Now, not sure if that works, I mean, Go ahead and tell me how you feel after eating a bowl of that. I had one this morning. I feel fine. I don't feel any different at all. I mean, I'm just, well, not really feeling the same about Pam Anderson anymore, though. Kicking off the list at number 10, a lot of hair. To kick off this wild part two, I had to include the tale of the woman who ate her own hair. Why did she do it? What happened? How much hair? Well, let's find out. All the questions about to be answered. The Liverpool Daily Post back in 1869 got the attention of those passerbyers with this one. A 30 year old passed away in the village of Lincolnshire. That's not too far off from the average life expectancy in the 1800s. But this case, this case was a little odd. Something was off about it. So doctors asked the family if they could carry out a post mortem. And lo and behold, a two pound solid chunk of hair was sitting in her stomach. It caused ulcerations of the stomach and ultimately caused her death. What a horrible way to go out. The woman's sister didn't know that over the last dozen years or so, she had been casually eating her own hair. Just one piece every now and then. Ultimately, it added up. If you know anybody that's eating their own hair, pass this on. Send them this video. This sounds rather uncomfortable. Number nine, cat attack. 
If I have to pick, I would say I am 100% a dog guy. Cats are cool, don't get me wrong, but this next story freaks me out a bit. Also, I had a cat once and I pulled its tail on it. <laughs> Hissed at me and scratched me and scared the life out of me. So, dog, dogs for sure. Back in 1870, a rich woman had put her time, energy, and resources into cat breeding. What a fun little hobby and lifestyle. She had tons of cats, she loved them all equally, and they loved her. I'm allergic also, so this story is my nightmare on a level. But it does sound like a cute time, I'll admit, that's a nice way. Especially like in the Victorian era, what a, what a lovely little pocket of fun. 1800s, a lot of candles, everything being extremely flammable, disaster hit often in Victorian times. And in 1870, a fire broke out of this young woman's home, and the cats were sadly trapped in the house. They made it out alive, but by the time they made it out, the two maids that had kicked the door open to rescue them, they had gone full primal. The cats just attacked them and it was all bad. The fire in the house had obviously scared them, so when the doors were open, these two maids were both attacked by them at full force, essentially, all of these cats. It's like, what a horrible thank you for saving all of their lives, you know what I mean? Number eight, quick divorce. Let's just say the love thing isn't working out, okay? It happens, people change, but now what? Say it's the Victorian era, but divorce in England isn't allowed until 1857, and it's 1856. So now what are we gonna do? Well, considering what list we're on and which part it is, it's pretty wildly unfair. If you were the wife, you were getting sold in this scenario. How horrible is that? Wife sellers, they were a thing. That was a legitimate business, how horrible. Yeah, you were getting sold if you were the wife, how horrible is that? Wife sellers was a legitimate business. There were auctions, public auctions would be done. You would watch people bid on marrying your wife. At like noon, middle of the day, people are walking by like, oh, do I have any change, hang on. This is insane. One real sale that happened in 1862 was in Selby. The asking price was a beer. The asking price for this person's wife was one pint. Sold, just like that, that's crazy. Sold, drank, now I'm married. That's insane. Other times, most of the time, it was a rather expensive exchange. I feel like there are plenty of cases where this would honestly be the ideal scenario. Just get it done in one day, whatever, peace. See you again, bye, you're the worst. Number seven, the Great Famine. We're gonna lean out of wife selling for a hot minute and include the boys for this one. Yeah, come on back in, you're all guilty. The Great Famine took out everybody, not just Victorian women, of course. Back in 1845, potato crop that a lot of the Irish population was relying on was no longer available all of a sudden. A group of microorganisms just wiped them out, just like that, and in result, around one million folks died or had to leave. It was draconian law and British ruling that made the exported food hard to reach people that really needed it. So this famine led to Irish independence and anti-union movements. A little fun bit of history I had to include on this one. Number six, the Brooklyn Theater Stampede. And we're back to absolute horribleness. Here we go. I love the theater. When the pandemic shut down plays, I actually felt pretty sad. I like sitting in full rooms watching a guy in a fake wig monologue about Mozart. Like that's my ideal Saturday night. That's the best. I don't want that to not be a thing anymore. I love theater. But today we have an obnoxious amount of distractions that can take you out of the experience. Guy's texting fighting his ex-girlfriend two rows ahead of me. I'm trying to watch Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. I'm like, man, it's not the same anymore. Theater's not the same anymore. Turn off your phone, throw a tomato at him. It can be distracting. Exit signs can also be pretty distracting, but we need them. We definitely need them. Because in 1876, the Brooklyn Theater caught fire after a single lantern fell over on stage during a performance. This was 1876. Everybody was wearing flammable attire. There aren't emergency exits yet. A fire marshal hadn't come in and counted heads at this point, so it was a disaster. 278 people lost their lives. A monument was put up after the incident. It shook the town, it was absolutely horrible. I read about this and I was like, that's horrible. We got included in, this is a horrible list. Number five, the hobble skirt. Yeah, so when people can't get out of burning theaters, it's stuff like this to blame. Just from this 1910 headline alone, I'm glad we don't have hobble skirts anymore. The June 12, 1910 headline reads, the hobble skirt is the latest freak in women's fashions. The latest freak. Skirts that are so tight around the ankle that locomotion is seriously impeded and speed is impossible. Nice. I'll take two, debit. Doesn't that sound like a bad time? Why would anyone want this? Sounds like you're gonna be late for everything. French designer Paul Poirier made these to free the bust, to free the, you know, have a lot of room in here, whilst shackling the legs. So you, in turn, have to, you can't move. Just what you need to move around uneven stone roads, I guess. Love the practicality on this one, Paul, thanks. Despite how ridiculous and unsafe the hobble skirt looks and acts, only the wealthy could afford such a thing. Shoot, oh man, must be nice. I'll just be over here wearing jeans like an idiot, 
Middle and lower class women wore skirts with slits or buttons so they could, you know, actually walk around. Yeah, what fools. Oh, sorry, you want a button? <laughs> I don't speak broke, sweetie. Number four, lead based. When I started here at the studio a year and a half ago, maybe two years, I was like, okay, I gotta put on face cream maybe. A lot of, a lot of lights, a lot of HD this. Time to get rid of these bags under my eyes finally. I don't know, maybe drink some water. See what happens. Finding a skincare routine of any sorts is easy now, dare I say. The lovely World Wide Web has our back. You can learn how to draw your eyebrows on while listening to true crime. It's wonderful where we are today. But the cosmetic game, whew, back in the 18th century, not great. Turns out, wasn't that great. Not that safe. RuPaul's drag race would have been a lethal sport, know what I mean? Back in the 18th century, lead mixed with vinegar was often used to make your face look, you know, more pale. The Victorian look, I guess, gotta have those veins pop out. A splash of sulfur for those freckles. Horrible idea. Queen Elizabeth I used cosmetics containing lead, mercury, and or arsenic. The same poison that took out George III and Napoleon Bonaparte. So, not safe at all in any time, period. In fact, arsenic was on the priority list of hazardous substances, and toxic metal exposure is still an issue we're facing in this era, let alone Victorian. Number two, arsenic dresses. If looks could kill, literally. You've heard of arsenic and old lace at some point, but what exactly are we talking about? Back in 1861, a poet by the name of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, real name, his wife, Fanny, also real name, her dress caught on fire and her burns were so bad that of course she sadly didn't survive. But this was sadly common in Victorian days. Puffy dresses, open candles as we heard earlier. These dresses back then, they were flammable as is, but some of them were made with literal poison. Some of them had arsenic made to have that like green look, like the real arsenic green look. It wasn't just in clothing either. Back in 1861, an artificial flower maker named Matilda Schurer used green arsenic laced powder and her fingernails had turned green and green foam started coming out of her mouth and it was just a horrible way to go out. Arsenic's not supposed to be inhaled, let alone worn. Although yeah, it did look nice for a hot minute. Not worth it. And finally, number one, Queen Victoria's threats. Being the queen and all, and we're talking about the Victorian era, I figured we'd end with this one. Being the queen and all, a security team is always needed, and during her reign, there were multiple, multiple attempts to harm the young queen. The first attack was back in 1840. It was an 18 year old man named Edward Oxford, and he fired towards the queen's carriage, but obviously and luckily missed. But when Edward was accused of high treason, he was actually found not guilty due to insanity. Then a couple years later, in 1842, it happened again. This time, two men fired at her. They were found guilty. In 1849, her carriage was attacked by William Hamilton. In 1850, as the carriage was passing the gates of Buckingham Palace, Robert Pate, a retired soldier, ran up and hit her with his cane. Victoria was okay, thankfully, but of course, she was shook. Then again in 1842, 1849, and 1872, attempt after attempt. But then things got a little worse. If you haven't heard of Boy Jones or anything that happened here, I saved it for last because it's extremely unsettling. A teenager stalked the queen back in 1838 until 1841. Edward Jones, AKA Boy Jones. This guy somehow managed to break into Buckingham Palace more than once. It was some Assassin's Creed type stuff. He just knew some back way, he climbed some window or whatever. The guy just knew it rev in. So he would break in and would more often than not just hide under the queen's sofa. He would sit on her throne sometimes and one of the worst things ever, he would go through her drawers and like go through her clothes and stuff, it was creepy. He would steal her clothes until eventually and thankfully he got caught. Of all the things you can do, of all the crimes you want to commit in the Victorian era, you're gonna go hide under a couch for five years? Okay, I'm glad he got caught, but just so weird. What a weird ending. Number 10, Boy Jones. What's more intimate than a stalker? Am I right, ladies? If there's one thing women have loved throughout history, it's having every second of their privacy being watched by some creepy man, right? No, I can only imagine it's been worse since the dawn of smartphones and social media. I just, that must be horrible. Well, as it turns out, there were some real creep wads in the Victorian era too. The boy Jones was a stalker of Queen Victoria who on multiple occasions snuck his way into Buckingham Palace, one time escaping with a pair of the Queen's underwear. What? Arrested multiple times, but still somehow found his way back to the palace. But what they should have done was swap the queen's underwear for a pair of mine after a shift in the garden center I used to work at. Oh yeah, nobody's coming for you after sniffing those bad boys. Oh! Number nine, graceful words. 
This was a time when ladies were supposed to be ladies, and that means manners are on the table and elbows are off. Dresses were worn to not show ankles, God forbid an ankle or wrist bust out. I think more importantly however, or rather unusual that is, is that women were expected to talk a certain way. Good evening Mr. Barrows, you must excuse my tardiness, there was a dreadful man screaming at me because my ankles were shown whilst mounting my carriage. Your what was showing love? Oh you hurdle it, I can't believe it, excuse me, I must be someone else. I don't need to tell you guys how ridiculous that is. I say fly out the handle ladies, wear what you want, do what you want. Number 7 Expectations Alright, this one goes out to all the married ladies in the audience. Hello, how are you? I'm doing great, thanks for asking. I'm curious as to why you got married and what your expectations were. Did you marry your high school sweetheart and live happily ever after? Maybe you had a shotgun wedding and after one night at the saloon. Maybe you just really wanted to find a nice man and settle down, start a family. Be a mother. I think any of those options are great, so as long as you have options. In Victorian England, you were expected to do the latter. Women were expected to get married and have kids, and that's about it, really. My question is, why were angles and wrists an issue, but giving birth isn't? What I mean is it's kind of a compromising position to be in. All I'm asking is that the girls get treated fairly and given choices and be allowed to show some ankle. This makes sense. You can look at her business down there, but you can't show an ankle. That doesn't make any sense. I'm a magician. Number six, double standard. Divorce sucks. It's no fun. The person you once loved and cherished is now the villain in your story. I love McDonald's and I don't ever want them to be the villain in my story. I love you guys. Gotta get those happy meals. Divorce is something that isn't new. Honestly, it was probably invented the second after marriage was. In Victorian times, men had the right to divorce their wife if they had committed adultery. Women could not. Well, if you refer to my last part, you know that men were doing more than a little window shopping when it came to women. When men left town for business, they would have hired the services of a woman who patrol the streets at night. No, I'm not talking about Batwoman either. So men can divorce women if they dare to do what they did on a regular basis. Yeah, that's that's totally fair. Not yeah, that's good. Equal. Absolutely. Yeah. Number five, emo girl. All the forever alone people, raise your hand. Let me hear you roar XD. I like to joke around a lot and say I'm a lawyer, a firefighter, and the cutest guy on the whole wide internet. But if there's one thing I know, it's people. I like people. I love them. I spend a lot of time with them, and after hearing this, I've come to the conclusion that this is where the emo girls come from. I figured it all out. It's down to a science. I'm a scientist now. Do you ever get that feeling in your tummy on Valentine's Day because you know it's going to be another one alone? And you'll be forced to be on your own, and, and, and that means sad music and crying in your room. Same, it's, it's Drake's Marvin room for me. Well, single women in Victorian times had similar issues. Since women were expected to marry and have kids, single women who were also forever alone were pitied by society, which I argue is just way worse. Who, who, no one wants to be pitied. Ugh. Number four, gold diggers. She take my money when I'm in need. As she drive Okay, anyway, back to the actual content. Well, not exactly. While today in a place like sunny California, you might see an older man with a woman who's half his age. Maybe he's driving a nice car or she's got on the very best and latest from Louis Vuitton. Stylish, yeah. Most of us think some thoughts about what we might think is going on there. We can kind of be judgmental sometimes when we see things like that. However, looking through a lens of 2022 to Victorian times might make the women of Victorian times appear to be gold diggers, but in reality, it was because all of their financials were tied to their husbands, legally too. Which, if you can imagine, that system didn't work too well. What if your husband is broke? What if your husband is running amok with sultry lasses on the street corners? Like I said before, no divorce, but even if she could leave him easily, supporting herself afterwards was going to be an issue, especially financially. Number two, no school for you. No higher education for women. Banned from going to university. I don't think so, not very nice, no, no. Honestly, any society that doesn't want half of their population to go to school probably has a few things to work out. It's a boys club and they can only go to university so that they can learn to be smarter and be businessmen so they can earn money and thus have the facilities to court a woman who really doesn't have a choice anyway. Women had jobs, not careers. And they were all the jobs that you can think of. The ones that were too feminine for men. 
as women were too feeble to participate in a men's job, which is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. I'm happy to say that in 2022, we showed them wrong. Chetty loves everyone. Just remember that, I love everybody. You go, girls. Number 10, train engine cleaner. Ever wanted to get inside a small hole in the engine of a train and shovel out the coal that was left in there? Ever wanted to go underneath a train where you can't fully stand up in the middle of the night and rake out a dusty ash pan, getting all kinds of ash and stuff in your mouth? Perfect! You can go join up with the railroad as a train engine cleaner. These guys would spend their days shoveling five to six tons of coal into the furnace of the steam trains, and then spend their nights climbing into said furnace, cleaning it out, and then going out in the middle of the freezing cold, wet night into a trench covered in water and oil and dust, and get right up under that sucker and pull out all the ashes and dust and crap that came out of the engine while it had been running all day. Number Number 9. Linker Boy or Linker Men Before the introduction of gas lights on the streets of London, the only gas lighting came in the form of small children who made you believe that you wouldn't be able to walk the streets without them tagging along with a torch to help guide your way. Then they'd expect a tip from you. Oh, rascals. They weren't so bad. They were generally pretty helpful in getting you from point A to point B while being able to see one foot in front of the other. And their charge was usually just one farthing, or the equivalent of a quarter. The linker boy, like a lot of the jobs on this list, was actually featured in a lot of art and literature from the time, and there were even some rather infamous ones, like Lawrence Casey, who was the personal linker boy for the courtesan Betty Careless. Oi, where you going mate? You forgot to like and subscribe to the channel. Oh, and while I've got your attention, why not take a little peek over at our Facebook, where you'll find behind the scenes content. Get on with it! All right, all right, bloody hell, bloody hell. Number eight, knock her up. No, not like that. God, look. I despise my alarm clock. It wakes me out of my deeply deserved beauty sleep at 6 a.m. every weekday morning. Now take the alarm clock and assign that job to a real person. That person is a knocker up, a person employed to wake up workers at mills and factories on early shifts, going from house to house using a long pole to knock on bedroom windows. In other words, a person employed to become the epitome of all my hatred in this world. If you had this job, well, you're not alive anymore, but I hate you. The people at the time were somewhat friendlier than they are now, and I'm sure the knocker upper wasn't a horrible person, but I'm sure there had to be some grumpy gills who would put their hand on your chest for doing this to them. Number seven, a phrenologist. I think if this YouTube thing doesn't work out for me, I'm gonna go and make up a science. It worked for phrenologists. They claimed that a person's personality, character traits, and abilities could all be figured out by bumps and indents on a person's skull. Characteristics like secretiveness, amativeness, conjugality, and combativeness were apparently controlled by areas of the brain that they called organs of the brain. The idea was dismissed by the church, but it nonetheless gained traction through Europe and was really popular in the States. The idea that you could modify these organs through self-control and practice sounded really good to self-help gurus at the time, if only it was real. Number six, a dog whipper. Looking for someone who absolutely despises dogs and doesn't mind being despised by the rest of us otherwise known as a dog whipper. Back in the day, huntsmen would often hunt foxes and nail their tails to church doors, which would attract dogs of the streets. You'd also have churchgoers who would bring their dogs with them to church. These dogs were not allowed in though, so they'd all have to wait outside. You know how dogs are though. They didn't just sit there waiting patiently. I'm sure some good boys and girls did, but more often than not, they'd be playing and sometimes fighting, disrupting the church services. Enter the dog whipper, who was armed with tongs to grab a dog and remove it from the church grounds, and a whip that would be used on the loudest of the poor pooches. Number five, a rat catcher. I know this will make a few of you out there squirm in your seats. Rats in Victorian England were a massive problem. They were everywhere every nook and cranny of your house, from the basement to the pipes. There was even an account of them spilling over from royal parks. So of course, where there is a problem, there is a job. Rat catchers were pretty famous throughout the Victorian era and were highly praised in society, but the job wasn't too glamorous. You'd be going into the dark, dirty places where rats would make their homes and catching and often killing thousands of rats a year. Often rat catchers would use other animals like dogs and ferrets to help them hunt down the rats too. I don't know though, it's gonna be me. Number three, matchstick makers. The idea of a lighter wasn't really a big thing in the Victorian era. 
They definitely existed, as the first one was invented in 1823, but it was not exactly a portable thing. So matches were your match. The first match was invented in 1805, but it sucked. The first friction activated match came about in 1826, and they were made with white phosphorus, which is extremely toxic. But they didn't have machines to make these matches. No, it was actually mainly done by teenage girls. And in the worst of conditions too. Forget protective gear. Oh, you wanna take your lunch break away from the highly toxic white phosphorus? Oh, no, no, no. That's right. These girls would have to eat their lunch at their workstations, meaning they would end up ingesting the white phosphorus. Mmm, yes, my favorite seasoning. Number two. Resurrectionists. Back in the day, medical schools who wished to study the human body only really had access to the bodies of criminals who had hit the end of the line. There actually weren't too many of these bodies around, which led to a good price for bodies that were in reasonably good condition, other than being deceased. This wasn't exactly the greatest idea, as now you've created an opportunity for people with no morals or empathy to go and dig up fresh graves, becoming resurrectionists. A cool name for an absolutely god-awful profession, if you could call it that. The problem was bad enough that people would actually guard the graves of their recently deceased loved ones. No one should have to do that. Number one, Night Soil Man. All right, if you need me, I'll be depositing my night soil over in the toilet. Poop. Night soil is poop. And the night soil man? Well, you see, before we had real sewer systems, the night soil you deposited at home would go into a lovely hole in the ground. As you can imagine, these would tend to fill up over time, and that's when you have your night soil men come in. Yes, his job was to clear out the poop deposits from houses and cart it away in the middle of the night so nobody in polite society would have to see it. But they were always in business, so that makes the job a little less crappy. Number nine, chimney sweep. I remember when I was younger, I had to sweep the chimney in the house every now and then, whatever, and I personally, I loved it, you know? I thought I was the father of the house for a bit, getting in the chimney, getting all dirty and stuff, doing this, my hands on my, on my waist, I don't know, it's, that's, that's what a man was when I was younger. That little broom too, I love that little broom. I remember when I would do this, my grandmother, who is very English, she would be shook, she would watch the entire time, she would be taken back into time because this was a terrible job to have in Victorian London. I was, yeah, it was not the same at all. Chimney sweeps were famously young. I can't say anything else there in regards, but yeah, they were wee lads to say the least. History is horrible. 1840 was a good year, all things considered, because a law was passed that then made it illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to climb in and then clean a chimney. Thank, thank God, I'm glad that stopped. I was 18 cleaning my chimney. I had no idea I could have used this great law. Been like, actually mother, a lot of claws. Number eight, funeral mute. Funerals suck, man. I was a pallbearer like three times before the age of 21. My one arm is just strong as now, that's it. I can lift anything just with one arm. I thought being a pallbearer had a lot of pressure, right? Victorian London, Saw many, many funeral mutes. Oliver Twist, one of those lousy jobs in that tale was that of a funeral mute. Funeral mutes were required to dress in all black with a sash while carrying a long cloth covered stick and your job would essentially be to stand and mourn silently at the door of the recently deceased home. Yeah, guy dies of a plague and you're like standing there like holding your breath like great, this is the worst job ever. You would then lead the coffin to the graveyard. So a lot of responsibility. Yeah, don't trip or breathe. Number seven, toilet troubles. Now the Victorian era was unsanitary to say the least, but it was also dangerous in ways that you wouldn't expect, right? Go to the bathroom and may not come out. One of the greatest Victorian inventions was that of the bathroom, but it took a few tries to figure out the whole, you know, methane gas problem. We gotta really deal with that one first and foremost. Spontaneous combustion of the bathroom was weirdly common. This would, uh, this is how, every time you take a shit, you were worried that you might just, Woo! That was horrible, that's so scary. Flammable gases like methane and hydrogen sulfide, they would build up over time with human waste. Human, a, a, a lot of human waste. Built up in the sewers and then eventually would back up into your homes. Next thing you know, you're lighting a candle and your bathroom's gone. Just like that. Now we have poopery. You know what that is? You ever see a little spray? After you go, you just, you hide what you've done with one little spray at your friend's house. It's fascinating how far we've come. Number six, stairs. Yeah, believe it or not, stairs were a common danger in Victorian times. I'm somebody personally who falls up and down stairs a lot. I'm 6'2", 
I'm lanky as shit. I have like a Gumby body. I walk around like Woody. I'm always falling up and down stuff. It's horrible. Especially in Canada. It's so slippery. I'm always, always slipping all the time. In Victorian times, I would have been doomed. Houses were thrown up comedically fast. There wasn't a Mike Holmes on Holmes to come in and check it out. There wasn't a building inspector that made things, you know, safe. Servant staircases, they were tiny. They were out of sight. They were built into these narrow walls, often missing steps that they had to and cut corners just to, you know, be narrow and out of the way. That plus a tray of hot soup and a lot of clothing, yeah, it was next to impossible to move around without something happening. A lot of fatalities in staircases. Even today, around 12,000 people die each year falling downstairs. Hold on to that railing. I'm here to remind you to hold on to that railing. It's crazy. There's actually no stairs there. I just made that whole thing up. Hit that like button for magic. Number five. Burke and Hare. Medical schools were offering a handsome fee for deceased bodies to study. This was, this is an odd time. So an unhealthy amount of Victorians came up with this new solution. They thought they were brilliant. Yeah, they would rob graves. They would just go and rob the freshest graves they could find. They would wait in the bushes until the funeral's over and then they would go and disgusting. It got so out of hand that family members were actually guarding the graves of recently deceased overnight. That's how bad it got. That's disgusting. But nobody goes down in history like William Burke and William Hare. They were an unlikely duo, to say the least. They wouldn't wait until the body was done living. You know what I mean? They would actually kill people and rush the process, all for a pretty penny. 16 victims in total between 1827 and 1828. It took 16 victims for people to start catching on to this weird plan. The pair would lure victims into their house, fill them with alcohol, and then they would suffocate them. They had a sick system and they would suffocate them because the body needed to be in the best condition possible in order to receive a payout from the Edinburgh University Medical School. So they would, you know, try and keep it as clean as possible, which is horrible to say, but it makes sense. The Anatomy Act in 1832 put an end to this horrific plan. Number four, bird hats. Look, I don't have much to say about this next one here because, well, all right, yeah. I love a good hat. I've worn a few hats here throughout my time on bumblebee, some baseball caps, some beanies here and there, sure. I've never worn a dead bird on my hat though, and I don't think that I will. That's for certain, I might just leave that out. Taxidermy was a hot topic back in Victorian London. Folks would rock the dead beaver bowler hat, any animal they would just prop up there, and it was considered fashion at the time, believe it or not. It was a dangerous trend though, long-term. Conservationists were saying that 67,000 species of birds were all at risk of extinction due to this crazy dead bird hat craze. Can you imagine just a stuffed seagull on my hat? I'm like, all right, number five, here we go. It's crazy. Also, that's like a lot of weight, you know what I mean? A lot of weight on your head, just kinda, oh sorry, there's just a dead pigeon on my head, so my neck's kinda sore. What if the wings opened up and you kinda just like got some air? Maybe that's why they did it. Number three, holiday cards. Today, these Hallmark holiday cards, they go way too hard. And they also have a card for everyone and everything, you name it. Birthdays, weddings, stepdad's name day, you're like, what? That's so specific. Like, they have everything covered. But back in the 1800s, these holiday cards, they were brand new. Nobody knew what to write or say, so they would just end up sending these artistic sentimental scenes. It would be like a frog in a top hat riding a bike. No caption, just that. You'd be like, hey, Merry Christmas, I guess. It'd be like a carrot with a face. It'd be a haunting image, really, to receive from a loved one on Christmas, but it's the thought that counts, I guess. This holiday season, just give your parents a card with this on it and then see what they do. Don't even write anything. Just stare at them in the corner, all Victorian-like, and be like, Mother, father, Merry Fortnite Christmas. I don't know what they would say. Number two, lots of arsenic. We of course have to mention a big problem in the 1800s. Arsenic, everywhere, all at once, okay? Skin lotion, tons of cosmetics, it was a nightmare. Even if you didn't use any facial cream or anything, it was everywhere else. It was in wallpaper, it was in dresses, it was in toys, medicine. My gosh, it really was horrible, it's a nightmare. And it's because arsenic was cheap at the time. It was during the Industrial Revolution. It was being unearthed more and more and finally, come 1851, the Arsenic Act was passed, which fixed a lot of issues. Yeah, we regulated that one. Not soon enough, but we definitely got that one fast. And finally, number one, Jack the Ripper. Unidentified to this day, we've got to end on a horrific note. Everybody's just finding out now about Jeffrey Dahmer, it seems. He's a hot topic on Netflix. But what about Jack the Ripper? How did he get away with it this entire time? Why aren't we going to see a Netflix doc on him? Ever. Jack the Ripper was active in the East London neighborhoods, primarily targeting sex workers in the area. Now, at the time, the murders of five women from August to November of 1888 
were believed to have been connected somehow to Jack the Ripper, although some sources claim that he was active even until 1891. Again, we're never gonna know at this point. Many believe Jack the Ripper had some anatomical knowledge due to the way that he left his victims. I can't really say anything else because it's disgusting, but yeah, he knew some things, disgustingly. And while there were some suspects, including a member of the British royal family, believe it or not, Jack the Ripper was still never identified. Number 10. The Doomsday Book, 1085. The Doomsday Book was created under William the First, also known as William the Conqueror. Like, you're already the first, man. You don't need two names, come on. This guy basically drew up a book to document people's money so that he could tax them. Oh yeah, this is the very first time surveyors went town to town and recorded how much money you would owe for simply just doing you. Men would show up at your house asking how much money you made and document your spending habits. Five shillings on groceries, huh? Okay and five on that phone plan. Look, tax season's coming up, Arthur. It's not looking good, man. Talk about a bunch of crooks, huh? Imagine owing someone money for just trying to make an honest living. Yeah, thank God that didn't catch on, right guys? Oh, speaking of, I got a phone H&R block. Number nine, The Crusades. A three-part miniseries spanning over 200 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for the proprietorship over sacred sites and the land in the East Mediterranean. A three-part miniseries spanning over 200 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for proprietorship over sacred sites and land in the East Mediterranean. Wars that resulted in six million deaths. The Knights Templar, a brotherhood of highly trained soldiers horseback bashing their way through the East. These guys were the real deal, almost like the Navy SEALs of their time. We've seen these paintings, the elite fighting force with the red cross painted on their chests. I wonder if they had to do a hell week. These soldiers were the most trained and savage fighters in all the Christian armies. Richard I leading the third and final crusade, earning him the name Richard the Lionheart. Back then the names were always something so aggressive and scary. It was never like Richard the Clownfish or Henry the Pygmy Goat. No, 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 we need fear way more fear. Number eight, the Magna Carta. The year is 1215. We need some laws, people. This document was one of its kind. A document setting out the laws and limitations from the common man to King John himself. A legal system written down so that there are clear do's and don'ts. No free man shall be seized, imprisoned, dispossessed, outlawed, exiled, or ruined in any way, nor in any way proceeded against except by the lawful judgment of his peers and the law of the land. Did you get all that? Right there down. Except women. They don't have laws. And they can't act in place. Sometimes people needed to face the music. And even animals. Huh? That's right, animals. Being tried. In a court. A lively and popular event trying any law-breaking animal from goats to pigs to even chickens. Ladies and gentlemen of the court, did you, Mr. Feathers, were peck the floor, yes or no? Objection, your honor, leading the witness. My brain can't fathom this, guys. Number seven, the Battle of Bannockburn. This infamous battle between Scotland and England was one of the most important battles of the Middle Ages. The end of the bloody war for independence. Basically, Scotland was like, yeah, we're gonna go over here and roll our R's. The gruesome wooden wars were caused by the English invading Scotland in 1296. A leader slowly rising the ranks, William Wallace, the guardian of the King of Scotland himself, holds off the English forces and is knighted a hero to Scotland. Unfortunately, like every hero back then, he was also hated. He was captured, hanged, drawn, and quartered. Like, why do you have to do all that after he dies? Like, he's dead. Not fun. The battles between Scotland and England ended in 1314 with Robert the Bruce securing Scotland's independence, adding like 45 more dialects to the UK. Freedom! Number six, the Black Death. Ooh, talk about a curveball. The year's 1348. People are saying things like, don't let the bed bugs bite. Clearly not a very clean and safe time. The Black Death, AKA, Pestilence, aka the Great Mortality, or simply known as the Plague. Single handedly, the worst pandemic ever recorded in history, wiping out somewhere between 70 to 200 million people. Ooh, now I get where Bless You comes from. Someone sneezed back then and everyone's dead at 14. This is where we see those doctors in the terrifying bird outfits with the long noses stuffed with garlic and herbs. Um, excuse me? Yeah, he's not wearing a mask. I I'm just trying to watch a cat publicly get skinned. Yeah, six feet please. Some doctors prescribed urinating on a person so that the bad smell would drive out the infection. Can you imagine? Just a doctor writing you up a script and go ahead and pee on yourself about four to five times a day. Take with food should be gone early next week. And just let me put my mask back on here before you leave. 
There you are. The plague started in Europe in October 1347 when 12 ships from the Black Sea docked at the Sicilian port of Messina. Most sailors aboard the ships were already dead. But those who were still alive were covered head to toe in black boils that oozed pus and blood. Ugh. Sometimes the Black Death included fever, chills, vomiting, diarrhea, temporary loss in motor skills, and then of course, death. Number 5. Joan of Arc Finally, a woman in the Middle Ages! Who to thunk? Joan of Arc was considered and still is revered the heroine of France for her role in the Siege of Orleans during France's Hundred Year War with England. Joan of Arc, a peasant with faith on her side, had believed that God had chosen her to lead France in victory against England and had spoken to her since she was young. At only age 17, she had stolen men's armors, a white horse, and like a Valkyrie riding into battle, she had convinced an entire army that she was appointed by God to win. And then did! That's the most badass thing I've ever heard. My entire life. After such a miraculous victory, her reputation spread among France, and upon her capture and death at 19, the Maid of Orleans herself would forever live on as one of the greatest saints and symbols of the country of France. Number 4. Henry V. Another war? All these people do is kill each other. Does anyone fish? Or golf? No one, huh? Just swords and heads, swords and heads. A history itself. This time, England beats France. King Henry V, Prince Hal himself, leans into his kingly duties, demolishing France and what Shakespeare would delve into years to come. The Battle of Agincourt is one of England's most celebrated victories and was one of the most important triumphs in the Hundred Years' War. Then, should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment, Henry V, prologue. Good stuff. How come these guys didn't just like rap battle or play soccer or something? Like an arrow right through the chest is way worse than a red card. Just saying. Hey, speaking of soccer. Number three, mob football. I'm not talking about the mafia. Put a thousand on Brady, would you? I'm talking about mob football, also known as folk football. It's just like our modern day soccer, town versus town. Except it has an unlimited amount of players. And there's only two rules to the game. Get the inflated pig's bladder over the opposing team's lines on the other side of town and no murdering. I mean, I guess this is closer to rugby? Yeah, this, this is literally just rugby. This game was played competitively and eventually outlawed at Oxford University in 1555. Just a guy named Jeeves in a polo. Oh uh, yeah, I play uh, mob football at Oxford. <sighs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm also in a frat. This game got so out of hand, it was banned numerous times in England. There is great noise in the city caused by hustling over large balls from which many evils may arise, which God forbid. We command and forbid on behalf of the king, on pain of imprisonment, such game to be used in the city of the future. Thankfully, this game has calmed down over the years and now has become the most popular played and watched game across the world. Go Liverpool! Number two, the printing press. The printing press is a machine that was designed for the mass printing of text mostly in form of books and newspapers. With an unknown date of origin, first invented in China, this machine designed in the 15th century by Johannes Gutenberg was a revolutionary new form of writing which would only change the direction of history with the mass production of uniform text. Eh, long story short, people didn't have to get the world's worst wrist cramp writing Hamlet over and over again. To be or not to be 86 more folios? <sighs> The alphabetical metal keys would be placed into the device and slammed into the paper, pressing ink upon the parchment. You know there's gotta be some books half written in purple ink because they just ran out of black. Come on, we've all been there. Ink's expensive. Number one, William Shakespeare. The bard himself, arguably the most influential writer of the English language. William Shakespeare was born in Stratford, England. One of the easiest ways we can look back into the dialogue and lifestyle used by the people living in the Middle Ages. This playwright documents the world in which he lives from 1564 to 1616. Due to Shakespeare's unbelievable talent for building and fabricating an array of diverse stories and characters via players, Modern day is able to see the Middle Ages and the similarities and differences the people were experiencing. His plays are based in the environment that they were written in. He writes about diseases, he writes about monarchy, he writes about women's rights. Okay, so no one actually got turned into a donkey by some fairies in the woods, but some of those wars actually did happen. And some of those kings and queens were really twisted. How this man created so many brilliant works and stories, all part of the mystery. Kicking off the list at number 10, Dark Dining. I don't know about you, but I can't eat in the dark. I need to see every single bite that I'm eating, okay? Call me crazy. Part of me wants to go to a restaurant where you can't see anything, but I know that I won't make it all the way through. I can't do it. I like, I have a thing. I have to just, I'm not blindly 
What if it's not cooked? I don't know. Back in the Victorian era, dining in complete darkness wasn't just a date night. It was actually the best way to digest, or so they thought. That's why many Victorian era homes had their dining rooms set up in their basement. How random is that? Oh, do you guys have poker nights down here? Nah, just brunch. Kill the light. <laughs> what? How do you like your eggs? Turn off the light. <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> Number nine, saved by the bell. I'm sure you've heard about this at some point, but allow me to go into grim detail. In the late 1700s, cholera, bacterial infections, everything bad, you name it, it was all spreading. Not an ideal time to be alive. Many were biting the bullet at this time, of course being gravely ill, but with this came a dark trend. The safety coffin. Yeah, we got a safety, we had the safety dance, now we got the safety coffin, here we go. These coffins, I mean, God forbid you were buried alive, these safety coffins would allow the dead to rise again and exit said coffin. A lot of these coffins have extra comfort on the inside and of course, a wire. This wire ran through the coffin, through the ground and attached to a bell on the outside. So if a passerby or heard it, one, that would be so scary, but if they heard it, they would know something's up and they would help them out. Folks would get creative with their safety coffins. For example, a man named Robert Robinson from Manchester, he passed in 1791, but he instructed his family and watchmen to open the special door on his casket, revealing a layer of glass. Now, if anybody were to see condensation, he could then be removed. Patent number 81,437. Was actually granted to Franz Vester in 1868. It was an approved burial case, a real patent. This was a real coffin. This is crazy. This one had an air inlet, a ladder, and a bell. All three, there you go. The description of the patent says, if too weak to ascend by the ladder, he could ring the bell, giving the desired alarm for help, and thus save himself from premature death by being buried alive. Nice. You thought you died. Psych, climb this ladder. There you go. Good luck getting out. Now you're in an escape room. Enjoy. You only get two hints. Like a walkie talkie. Hey, uh, how do I get out of the coffin in room B? Number eight, no air. Now that song's gonna be stuck in your head. Jordan Sparks, a classic. Since we're on the topic of safety coffins, I had to include one more. Maybe two more, I'll never tell. This one is fascinating. The science involved here was honestly impressive. There was the classic wire and bell method, but the more sick people got, the more creative they had to become. Like for example, patent number 268,693, John Krishbaum's device for indicating life in buried persons. Yeah, an 1882 classic, we love this. We got the iPod Nano, they got the device o life. Nice. Upon first glance, you may think this is some type of medieval punishment, whatever, but really this device detects movement whilst providing much needed air. Now you obviously can't have a hole in the ground or else rats will make your real demise much worse than suffocating, right? So John's device here, as per the disclosure details, is that if the person buried should come to life, a motion of his hands will turn the branches of the T-shaped pipe upon or near which his hands are placed. A marked scale on the side of the top indicates movement of the T and air will then pass come down the pipe. Once sufficient time has passed to assure the person is dead, the device can be removed. Yeah, imagine waking up with this in your hands. I wouldn't be calm enough to turn it and then breathe in a passive amount of air. No way, there's nothing passive about waking up in a coffin. Number seven, bad hair day. Okay, you want it messed up? Let's do messed up. Hope you're not eating any food right now, especially not eating in the dark. Two red flags. Okay, the Liverpool Daily Post back in 1869 had readers invested on this fateful day. Right on the cover it read, a 30 year old passed away in the village of Lincolnshire. Now at the time, that's not far off from average life expectancy in the 1800s. But this case was odd. Everyone wanted to read about this. This case was noteworthy. It was important that folks understood what took this young lady's life. Doctors asked the family if they can carry out a post-mortem and lo and behold, they found a two pound solid chunk of hair sitting in her stomach. Two pounds. That's what happened. That's how she met her fate. That's horrible. This ball of hair caused an ulceration of the stomach and ultimately caused her death. The woman's sister did note that over the last dozen years or so, she had casually been eating her own hair. So at this time I say, if you know anybody eating hair, send them this link. It's not a good idea. Cut that out. Stop doing that. Number six, the Great Famine. Weird time to talk about a famine after the hair incident, but okay, here we go. Back in 1845, a potato crop that a lot of the Irish population relied on was no longer available. This was huge. This is bad history right here. A group of microorganisms wiped them all out and in result, around 1 million folks died or had to leave. It was draconian law at this point and British ruling that made the exported food hard to reach people. This famine led to Irish independence and anti-union movements. 
Historical, definitely. Messed up, absolutely. Number five, Queen Victoria's name change. Every year on May 2-4, we set off fireworks, then we have way too many hot dogs. It's the best. We call it Victoria Day, right? It's for sure called Victoria Day, right? Well, back in 1819, Victoria was christened in an almost private ceremony. It was small, obviously. Victoria's uncle only let a few people attend. Like I mentioned in part one, she had an isolated childhood with the whole Kensington system. That was no way to live. But even the day she was christened, trouble awaited. Her name was Alexandrina Victoria, and at the time, the name Victoria was not regal. It was a French origin, almost an odd name to have at the time, so she was immediately advised to change her name to something more traditional. But as our calendars can definitely confirm, she said, nope, I'm good. Victoria Day. Yeah, it's definitely Victoria Day. Number four, tattoos. I only have the one tattoo, but I've always wanted more. Just not so good with needles, you know? I got my eyebrow pierced and I fainted. It's a fun fact, I have a little scar there. Not great with needles. Some of the designs are so beautiful on tattoos, the amount of pain you all sit through, I'm impressed, honestly, mad respect. The tattoo craze really took off once Queen Victoria's son, the Prince of Wales, he went and visited Jerusalem. And of course he saw copious amounts of body art and was inspired. Inspired, we'll say, yeah. So upon his return, he was all about ink at this point. And the Prince of Wales, well if he has a sleeve, well then maybe I can have a sleeve, right? What's going on? It wasn't a sleeve, really, it was a cross. The prince got a tattoo of a cross in homage to the Crusades. So if you're gonna try and convince your parents to let you get a tattoo, just, you know, tell them the Prince of Wales did, right? You're just trying to be a royal. Number three, gym day. Believe it or not, there were around 200 gyms across Europe during Victorian times. Yeah, just like six good lives. You're like, what? what's this about? Even Victorian dudes skip leg day. How great is that, okay? It's not just you. These gyms weren't bright, they weren't open, they weren't well ventilated, they weren't motivating, and definitely not safe. None of those, definitely not. No, Victorian gyms were reserved for the upper class, obviously. Grab your pocket watch and blazer, Ezekiel. We're doing squats today. These machines also were not ideal. They were designed as antiques first rather than their purpose. Also, half of these look like saw traps. Like, are you kidding me? No way I'd bend my arm around any of these devices. No way. All those wooden wheels? No. I'll stay weak and brittle. Thank you. Number two, ghost photography. I had to look back. I don't like talking about ghosts. As if the reanimated corpses coming back to life while they were ringing a bell wasn't scary enough. Yeah, let's talk about 1800s ghost photography. The camera was a hot new invention at this time, so tales of ghosts and spirits were now easily believed. Yeah, obviously, when you have a photo of a see-through woman, you're like, I, that must be, that's pretty terrifying. A big name in the ghost game was a man named William Thomas Stead. He was born in 1849 and Stead was the son of a Congregationalist minister and at the age of 22 he was appointed as editor of Northern Echo, which was a regional newspaper in Darlington. So far, so good. This British medium, Richard Borsonal, featured a photo of W.T. Stead and a real spirit. Yeah, imagine that. Imagine a day where somebody being awarded the Nobel Peace Prize also poses for photo ops with ghosts. You're like, I don't, do we believe all of this or none of this? What's going on? This is so scary. And finally, number one, music for eternity. Before we wrap up this wild part two, I had to include perhaps one of the creepiest patents of all time. Patent numero 9,222,059. Yeah, the number is going a little bit higher. This one got me thinking. I wanted to end this video off on this note. I like this idea. Maybe, I don't know yet. Music for Eternity Systems. Okay, this patent is not from the 1800s, but rather 2015. I know, it's not Victorian, but when else am I gonna talk about this, really? The idea here is that you could stay connected to your loved one by using a solar-powered digital music player. The best part here is the patent details how surviving family members now have the ability to update, revise, and edit stored audio files and programming after burial. Yeah, next Rihanna album, no problem, I got you. There's a speaker in the casket and there's a headphone jack on the tombstone so we can listen together and then we can decide if we hate the album. That's creepy, I wouldn't do this. Would you want this? Sound off below if you'd want, you know, big shiny tunes playing for eternity after you die. I would do the Titanic theme song, just make everyone so sad all the time. Kicking off the list at number 10, an arming squire. Being a knight, okay, obviously this sounds cool on paper. They have the sword, they have the horse, the flowing lady, the gal on the back of said horse. They're saving the damsel in distress or something, right? Sometimes they lose a hand like Jamie Lannister, but that's just what being a knight is all about, right? 
Also, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen Game of Thrones nine years ago. It wasn't always a fairy tale epic being a knight. First of all, this process starts when you're seven years old as well. So you would be given to a noble to learn for seven years, and then at age 14, you became a squire. Ah, yes, a noble squire. We've heard this term before. What do they do? Uh, well, it's, it's a knight's intern. Yeah, not an ideal job to have when you're young, but it's a job nonetheless. Also, you had no choice, so you, you had to do it. Welcome to the Middle Ages. Arming squires, they had a lot of responsibility. Arming squires would repair a knight's armor while they were still wearing it. Yeah, how fun is that? Oh, which buckle was it? Ah, uh, yes, that one. Mm. Yeah, fixing up chain mail on a grown man's thigh. Not ideal, welcome to the Dark Ages, pretty dark. Also, after these epic, messy battles, arming squires would have to clean everything off of their armor. Yeah, everything. A lot of yuck going on in that business day. This was long before Dawn soap was also a thing, so they had to clean with urine. Yeah, gross, so gross, it gets worse and worse. Welcome to the Dark Ages. Number nine, Plague Bearer. Yep, this one's as awful as it sounds. The title of this one really gives it away. Ah, the hot summer of July 1665. What to do with all of these poor souls who have been hit by the plague in the Dark Ages? Where do we put them? What do we do? You can't just hide them all in the catacombs this time around. So now what? Well, a plague bearer, he's got your back. Church wardens would organize burials, right? This was a normal thing even back in the Dark Ages in the 1600s, but when the plague hit, they had to change things up a little bit. If somebody had the plague, these guys would be responsible for transporting them far, far away and then burying them. A church would house these plagued souls away from society. How grim is that? But it's probably a great call, all things considered. Poor guy. Number eight, a knight. When we think of the knights and you know the dark ages and stuff, we often forget about the silly royal duties that one had to attend to. Yeah, you thought jury duty sucked. Oh boy. Beastly justice. You ever heard of this? If not, buckle in. Beastly justice was when animals had to go to court. Yeah, they were put on trial as well, as well as humans. It's wild to look back at a knight and all the things they had to do for their kings and queens, but the fact they also had to wake up early and attend court, like a noble, like royal court, where a wild animal was now taking the stand. Like, what a joke. I'd be like, really? Do I have to be here? I woke up at 4.30, what's going on? Yeah, this would happen after an animal runs through town. It would attack people, you know, being confused and being an animal and all. But the townsfolk would actually believe that the devil was somehow involved in this whole ordeal. Like, these animals worked for Big Red himself, right? How weird is that? In 1457, villagers in France had to deal with six pigs who ran wild and attacked locals. They did a lot of damage apparently. But instead of just, you know, setting the animals free or putting them down or whatever, they just took them to court. A real court, like a real trial. There was a judge, a couple prosecutors, eight witnesses, a defense attorney for the pigs, which I gotta say that we gotta do a list on that. That's a terrible job. That's one of the worst jobs ever, I, I lightly introduced here. These pigs were then hung from a gallows tree. It was so horrible. The dark ages, dark, right? A knight had to formally hang pigs after a trial was concluded. Yeah, being a knight sucked. Number seven, leech collector. I always enjoyed catching frogs growing up. That was always fun, but apparently I, I gotta step my game up. <laughs> this is weak. A leech collector is, well, exactly what you think. Back when medicine was pretty much non-existent, sickness was just wafting throughout these old towns, just eh, moving through towns. Like the G from the Goosebumps logo, just haunting towns, moving through. Scariest intro ever, eh? So the solution back in the day was the classic, oh, if you feel sick, maybe try bleeding for a bit. Mm, see if that helps. Yeah, they would use horses' legs to lure out these leeches, but most of the time, these leech collectors would have to get in and get dirty and just grab them themselves. They would have to swim around and touch as many things as possible. They would make contact with as many leeches as possible. How gross is that? That was the best way to collect them, really. I would have fainted so often, that is horrible. The loss of blood here was obviously so intense, so it was a you know horrible job to have. And on top of that, you gotta look out for the same reason they need leeches in the first place. Disease, yeah, that's still out there. Leech collectors were so common throughout the 18th century that leeches basically were extinct at that point. We almost lost leeches, oh, so close. Number six, jesters. The earliest accounts of the fool go back to the 11th century, so pretty OG. These fools were hired to liven up the party, you know, dance and be silly, wear pajamas. Most of you have an image of a jester in your head, you know, jumping around on tables, telling jokes. That's actually pretty accurate. Yeah, it was pretty fun. It was one of the best jobs to have, obviously. This title of a minstrel or a fool, rather, it was an honor to have. The fool's payment also was was no funny business, that was good stuff. Roland Le Petier, he was like a major jester back in the day. This guy got 30 acres of land from King Henry II. Just here, here you go. Just show up and fart and be funny. 
How about this land? That's like a kingdom. You have a kingdom because you're funny and you're silly. He would whistle, jump around, and literally fart on people. On Christmas Day, this guy would come over and just ruin your entire breakfast and just be like, yeah, I have all this land. And then he would take off. It's crazy. You just ruined Christmas, sir. Stop farting on my food and family. Thank you. I would never want to be a jester. They had to also like go into battle and like spread bad news too. It was fun and silly, but they were also royal. They had to do lousy stuff too. Number five. Groom of the stool. Nowadays, higher ups in the office, they have assistants, you know, to grab your coffee for you. Maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off, you know, doing your businessman stuff. Assistants are vital today. The groom of the stool, though, that was, uh, huh, that was a bit much. We have some labor laws put in place now. I don't think we're gonna see any online ads opening for a groom of the stool. We'll see though, fingers crossed, had good benefits. Back in the Dark Ages, this role was vital and respected. It was created by King Henry VIII, and this role was to assist the king, and specifically assist his bowel movements. You had a box that you carried with you at all times. That's where the, that's where the magic happened. The dark magic happened in this box. You would literally follow the king around until he needed to go to the washroom, until he needed said box. Porta potties weren't a thing back then, and there's no way you're going to catch that king squatting in the woods. In fact, you wouldn't even catch that king wiping his own behind. That chore was also reserved for the groom o the stool. Yeah, lucky you, right? In this stool, you would have water, towels, a wash bowl. The whole setup would be in there. You're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? A prisoner? Somebody who lost their sense of smell, hopefully? No, only sons of noblemen could take on this role. And in doing so, they also gain access to every room in the castle, tons of clothes, any bedchamber furnishings, you name it. And of course, a high pay. Always helps. Thank God. That's maybe the worst job in history. Maybe. We're almost there. You'll see. Number four, divorce lawyers. If you've seen Game of Thrones, you've heard of trial by combat. That was, the, that was the norm back in the day. You know, you fight for your freedom. That's great. But what about divorce by combat? What in the Mr. and Mrs. Smith is happening? Was this real? I can't believe this. If you and your significant other weren't getting along in the dark ages, instead of, you know, dishing out thousands on couples therapy and signing all that paperwork and getting it done with and going your separate ways, no, instead they would battle each other, like combat. It was an organized event too. It had restrictions in place for the husband. It's pretty hilarious to think back on. Like the husband would have to stand in a hole with one hand tied behind his back while the wife ran circles around this hole with a sack full of rocks. A sack full of rocks, how intense is that? That's why you don't cheat in the dark ages, Lancelot, okay? Just take the barn, take the horse, take it all, I quit. Get me out of this hole, untie me. Number three, toshers. Toss a coin to your tosher, here we go. This was one of the worst jobs back in the day and it wasn't even a legal job. Shh, don't tell. If you don't need, uh, if you don't need toshers, Keep, keep their secret, you know? Early 19th century London, I know, a little more modern here, but definitely worth a mention. These toshers would spend all their time in sewers below London trying to find coins or valuables that have been just accidentally washed away. Yeah, they would just search for scrap metals, anything really that nobody else wants to go down and claim, or reclaim rather. It was worth the plunge as well. A lot of these folks would make around 20,000 a year. Just gotta do this a lot, and you're good. Number two, dentist, doctor, surgeon, spy. Dentists were not a thing in the Middle Ages, you know. Dr. Downer didn't politely tell you to floss more and then shake your hands while you're watching a show getting a cleaning. No, it wasn't like that at all. They did have a barber. They had one guy, he did it all. A barber from the Dark Ages. Yeah, this appointment is gonna suck, my friends. Cavity, toothache, maybe you accidentally bit a rock, chipped a molar. They would only pull these teeth. That was the only solution. Barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, bloodletting, you know, the classic three-in-one appointment we all have to do every month. Doctors were seen throughout history and they've seen a lot of horrible stuff. Back in the 1500s, patients were walking in with an arrow sticking out of their legs. Yeah, instead of cutting the tip off and pulling the opposite way, the arrow removed mover would come in and then, you know, cut into the injury, opening it more. That's always great. And then you would hold it open and then you'd pull the entire arrow back out of your leg. Yeah, what a fun job. Or chest. Wherever the arrow went, you had to figure that out. It's poor soul. And finally, number one, the rat catcher. Another Game of Thrones classic. If you're a rat person, I know there's a lot of people who do like rats, like rat tricks and they have like cool rat friends. That's awesome. I'm not one of those people. I'm not bashing you, but I am bashing this job. This would suck. First of all, rats as a medieval punishment was horrible. Where do I even begin with this one? This was one of the worst punishments for the rats as well. This is a two for one when it comes to pain. A rat trap involved a man being tied down to something and then a metal enclosure would be strapped to his abdomen or chest. And then inside this enclosure, they were rats and they were also like 
like tucked away. And then historically, they would heat the uh, metal enclosure and the rats would panic and try and get out and they would chew through the softest part, which in this case was your chest or abdomen. It was horrible, it was an absolute nightmare. But these rats had to come from somewhere, or rather, someone. As the name hints towards, rat catchers are one of the worst jobs you can have in, or rather, out of a castle. It's an important role, you know, just like being a fool or a literal walking, talking toilet. There needs to be a chasseur de rats. Back in those times, rats and mice were the leading source of spreading disease, and with these castles being big and dark, there were probably a lot of them hiding. Black rats were a common household problem, so we need to get those out. So in comes the well-respected rat catcher. These guys would sometimes try new spells to get rid of the rats. Wasn't always helpful, wouldn't work. More often than not, didn't work. So poison powders were the next main trick here. Also the Pied Piper, he was an OG, historically. He would do a musical number to exterminate your pets. If anything, he should be getting a bonus. Any rat catcher, actually, today or back in the dark ages, you deserve a bonus, my friend. You're a brave soul. 